President of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons, and it is my proud privilege to welcome all to this monthly webinar series. I welcome all to this episode uh, on partial uh, knee arthroplasty, and Dr. Guruva Reddy from Hyderabad is going to be the convener. I welcome all uh, the guest faculty from across the globe. We have uh, Christopher Dodd from Oxford, Dr. Martin Roche from uh, Florida, USA, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Thienpoint from Belgium. He's going to be joining us a little later. And our own Dr. Arun Mullaji from Mumbai, who needs no introduction to this crowd. And I request Dr. Guruva Reddy now to take over the uh, job of taking this webinar ahead. Guruva. Over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Eman. It's such a privilege and pleasure to be among the galaxy of uh, icons, starting with my old, good old friend, Arun, but I'll introduce him to the last. So Martin Roche is the director of the robotic joint reconstruction at Holy Cross Hospital, Florida. He specializes in complex knee disorders. He performed the first sensor assisted and robotic assisted knee surgery in the world. Dr. Roche completed his training in orthopedic surgery in University of Miami and joined Holy Cross Hospital in 1996. He's a pioneer in minimally invasive joint replacement surgery, robotics, and applied sensor-based technology in orthopedic surgery. Martin is a developer of the macro surgical knee system, which is one of the leading robots in the world performing the knee replacements, partial knees and hip replacements. And Dr. Roche is the founder and chief medical officer of the OrthoSensor, which develops advanced sensors with orthopedic applications to improve the accuracy in uh, complex knee surgeries. He's a member of AOS, ARCUS, AMA, EKS, and the International Society for Technology in Orthoplasty. He has more than 70 publications in the field of orthopedics. So Martin, it's such a pleasure to have you with us, and it's a great privilege to have you here, Martin Roche. Thank you. Then we go to the other part of the world, England, Christopher Dodd, and he is, uh, I as I jokingly say, like uh, <clears throat> Thurston Gurke, he's half Indian. Christopher has done so many programs in India. He, is, uh, he was a lead in Oxford NHS, and now he's just recently retired. And he had done remarkable research and fellowship in Johns Hopkins University in 1990. And he has been a consultant orthopedic surgeon, principally interested in knee surgery in Newfield Orthopedic Center. Recently, he's retired. He's an honorary clinical lecturer in the University of Oxford. He has published high value research in the field of unique compartmental knee arthroplasty. In India, if anybody wants to talk about Oxford knee, his name has to come first in the list. And he lectures widely on the national and international circuit, especially in the Oxford workshops and sports injuries and ligament repairs. He was the educational secretary of a British Association for Surgery of the Knee Basque and maintains a high profile in international orthopedics. And welcome, Chris. It's such a pleasure and privilege to have you here. And uh, Dr. Professor Emmanuel Thiempoint, though he's not here, he will join us late. He is the head of the Clinic Universalis of Knee Surgery Unit in Brussels. He is the immediate past president of the European Knee Society. He specializes in knee arthroplasty and his areas of interest include placement of the resurfacing process, the study and development of the patient matched knee implants and patient specific instrumentations, management of hemorrhage prevention in full knee replacements and recovery of dysfunctional or painful knee process. Professor Team Point has a PhD from the Ghent University for his work on alignment in knee arthroplasty. He has published two books, including Improving Accuracy in Knee Arthroplasty. Mm -hmm. Professor Team Point has published more than 85 articles in various international journals. He is a member of the Board of Directors of European Knee Society, Belgium Knee Society, and Orthopedics Today. He is also a member of the American Society of Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So it's such a pleasure to have him here. He will be joining us late. And uh, lastly, my good old friend, Arun Mulaji. And uh, as uh, Heman said, he doesn't need introduction, but I have to introduce him. And uh, he was our past president. And uh, 
He is a, a joint replacement surgeon in Breach Candy Hospital, Hinduja Healthcare, author of over 100 scientific published papers, books, and chapters, nearly 3,000 citations. Mm -hmm. He is the founder member and past president of our Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgery. He is the past president of Asia Pacific Orthopathy Society, APAS. He is one of the designers of Etu Knee System, and he is a holder of five patents. Probably he's a billionaire by this uh, patents. He's a keynote speaker and faculty at international meetings, including current concepts in joint replacement, Australian Orthopedic Association, APAS, International Society for Technology, British Orthopedic Association, American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons. He has delivered a prestigious Arnold Henry oration at the British Association of Knee and recipient of Wishbone Trust Award from the British Orthopedic Association. He was trained in USCI, UK, Germany, and he was my senior in MCH in Liverpool. He is a, a excellent speaker and a great personal friend. Arun, thank you so much for joining us. So the most uh, important and the most pleasurable event of this introduction is over. Now I leave it to Chris, the discussion goes like this. After Chris talk, we'll have a, he's not there. He's coming last in the list. So then we we'll go to Martin and Martin will talk on the technology in unicondyles. And then Arun will enumerate his journey in India, which is more relevant to us. What are his thought process? And we will be guided by him. And over to you, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my talk? Yes, we can. Clearly. Good. Good. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like uh, to welcome you all to this uh, talk and to this uh, meeting. I do hope uh, that you will find uh, this interesting. Unis, of course, have been around for a long, long time, but uh, they are now making a huge resurgence, uh, particularly in places like India. So I was asked to talk on the Oxford Partial Knee uh, Overview, Evolution and Results. Uh, by way of disclosure, I, I do receive royalties uh, on behalf of the uh, Oxford Knee. So some of what I say must be taken uh, with that in mind. So, of course, we should begin by questioning whether there's a need to consider unis. Uh, and of course, there's an enduring debate, uh, uni versus total. Why do we not just do a total? It's so much easier. Well, what about the evidence? Well, historically, we know uh, unis have many advantages over total knees, and I've listed a few of them here, function, satisfaction, recovery is better, uh, morbidity and mortality is less, and of course, uh, they can be done as day cases much more easily than the bigger procedures, so there are significant cost implications. But of course, the elephant in the room are the registries, and they show a much higher failure rate, and that puts off uh, many, many surgeons, if not all of us to begin with. Now, unis are done in younger and fitter patients uh, than total knees, so you can't compare them unless you match them. And I will talk about a randomized study. Um, we now have very large data sets, uh, registries, um, and if we look at them carefully and uh, comparatively, we can uh, eke out the differences uh, between unis and totals. So we've looked at uh, merging the National Joint Register in the UK, uh, HESS's readmission data, and the Office for National Statistics. And these large data sets can be uh, matched if you use propensity score analysis. In other words, uh, you have to look at large numbers, you match them on the confounding variables such as scores and deprivation and comorbidities. So if you do look at 100,000 knees, one uni to three totals, uh, you can then, in the absence of a randomized study, get perfect balance. And that's what's meant to be shown on the right. So first of all, how happy are the patients when you compare them? Well, this is looking at NJR and HESS, uh, 3,500 unis and 10,500 total knees. If we look at the patient reported outcome, the Oxford score, uh, unis have 38 uh, versus totals 36, clearly significantly better. And we know that our unis tend to be our most satisfied patients. If you subdivide the Oxford scores in this histogram, excellent on the right, you can see 60% more favorable uh, or excellent unis compared to totals. And on the left, fewer poor unis. Satisfaction is about 30% better. Uh, and if you look at EQ5D, it's significantly better and that's health economics. So what about complications? Length of stay tends to be less, readmission less, intraoperative complications about a third less, transfusion about a quarter. 
But if we look at potentially serious issues, DVT and PE, if we look at infection, if we look at stroke, if we look at MI, these large data sets tell us that if you compare them, unis are much safer, somewhere between a third and a half the risk of these long-term potential benefits on health. So of course, we can look at mortality, an issue that our patients are probably much more worried about than revision. And if you look here, unis at the top seem to be uh, less of a problem in terms of death than totals. At 30 days, it's about a fifth, and at 90 days, it's about half. You can go on beyond that. And if you look at the curves, they're diverging out to four years. So there's an effect there out to four years, and then there afterwards, they're parallel. And at eight years, uh, about 13% difference favoring unis. So what does this mean? Well, if we were to do 100 unis instead of one total knee, one life would be saved at the expense of three extra revisions. So that all needs to be put into the pot. Now, there's a caveat here. We're not at all suggesting that a total knee uh, <clears throat> is an unsafe operation. Of course, it's safe. Patients with arthritis are unfit uh, because of their problem. Following a total knee, their mortality decreases. But if they happen to be suitable for a uni, their mortality is even lower. So the best patients for unis are the older unfit patients. They do remarkably well and they recover very swiftly. But of course, the big problem is the revision rate. We as surgeons worry about revision rates and in all the registries, and this is the UK register here, the revision rate of unis is about three times higher. And that is the single biggest bar to surgeons adopting unis. They worry about this. So of course, many surgeons don't do unis. You could, however, seek to understand the issues involved, thereby seeking solutions. And that's what many of us have done. There is a major problem, however. If you look at surgeon volume versus revision rate, and this is NJR data, first of all, you can see uh, most surgeons do very few unis on the left-hand side. They're usually done in young patients with early arthritis as a pre-total knee. And those surgeons may be doing one or two a year, which is a nightmare. And in fact, until recently, the most common number of unis per surgeon per year in the UK was one, believe it or not. The second most common was two, and the mean was 5.4. And if you look here, that equates to 2.5 revisions per 100 patient years, 25% failure rate at 10 years, a 75% survivorship, clearly not as good. But as you go to the right and you do more of them, the revision rate gets less. But obviously surgeons can't increase their replacement practice, particularly when they're first beginning. What they have to do, however, to do unis is to understand indications and technique. And this is a really important slide. And this is uh, the evolution of our understanding of indications. We were told that if you do more and more unis and fewer and fewer totals, you'll get a higher revision rate. This is not true. So this is each individual uh, Oxford surgeon's NJR data. And our fellow Alex Little looked at each individual practice and equated their revision rate on the y-axis with the percentage of unis that they did as knee replacements. So on the left-hand side, there were total knee guys. And as you proceed to the right, you do more unis and fewer totals. Obviously on the right-hand side, very few surgeons are doing more than 50%. So that data is unreliable. However, on the left, many surgeons are doing small numbers. This data is extremely reliable. And what you can see graphically is that unless you get to 20%, there's a high revision rate. And this has transformed the debate. If you want to get the advantage of unis, you need to look for the patients, commit to doing unis, and you will get excellent results. And surprisingly, the lowest revision rates around about half of knees being unis. And the optimal usage is somewhere between 20 and 50%. So just to reiterate that, if you want all the advantage of unis, don't do one or two a year. Stop doing unis do totals. But if you want to embrace unis, you've got to aim for a minimum of 20%. So the second evolution was an understanding that we made this very uh, difficult. Uh, the actual indications are very straightforward and they're almost entirely radiological. And you need to do uh, and look at your knee replacement x-rays and ask the question, does the patient have anteromedial osteoarthritis? In other words, do they have bone on bone in the medial compartment and do they have intact ligaments? And in India, you are very fortunate because of tibia vera. You have huge numbers of patients with antremedial osteoarthritis. So do download the radiological decision aids. It's from the web and you need to look at whether there's bone on bone on the medial side. And if there is, think uni. You need to make sure the ACL is intact. 
So look at the lateral X-ray and make sure the defect does not extend posteriorly to the back. If there is bone retained at the back, the ACL is intact. There needs to be full thickness cartilage laterally and a functionally intact MCL, and that's a stress X-ray. And you can ignore the patellofemoral joint unless there's severe lateral facet bone on bone. This is highly predictive of whether the patient is suitable for a uni. And that's all you need to do. There are virtually no contraindications if the patient has antromedial osteoarthritis. Patellofemoral joint bone exposed, we ignore. The site of the pain is not important. Young, old, active, inactive, heavy, light, does not matter. It has no bearing on the results and whether they have chondrocalcinosis. And because the surgeon looks at patients and they look for antromedial osteoarthritis and they find it very commonly, they can do 20% in no time at all. And some surgeons love it. They get very happy patients. They don't have to look after them much postoperatively. They can be done as day cases and some surgeons will get up to 50% in no time at all. So what about the impact of broad indication? Surely there must be a negative impact. Well, this is somewhat biased data. It's our data, a thousand MIS unis, consecutive series, independently assessed by our physio. And we subdivided them into Cozen and Scott's narrow indications versus our more broad indications, which are evidence-based. And you can see that only a third of our cases are ideal, according to Cozen and Scott. Two thirds are um, broader indications. And if you look at the outcome measures, Oxford Knee Score, American uh, Knee Society Score, and Tegna, no difference whether they are non-ideal or ideal. And importantly, out to 12 years, there's no difference in the failure rate. If the patient has antromedial osteoarthritis, you can do a uni. What about published and phase, uh, presented phase three? Medials with 10-year survivorship. If you look at the middle column, many surgeries, uh, many uh, series now uh, with uh, a 10-year survivorship between 90 and 95%, every bit as good as totals. But what is remarkable is the percentage of unis in these series, somewhere between 20, 30, and 50%. Broad indications does not compromise 10-year survivorship. And here's the, uh, the randomized study from the UK, it's called TopCat, a pragmatic randomized study in the NHS, 27 centers, 63 different surgeons, both Mobile were two third, the fixed were one third, uh, 531 knees randomized. All results favored the partial knee. Most were not statistically significant and that was the outcome score, complications and reoperation, uh, revision, et cetera. Statistically significant differences. So in the Oxford score, there was a 1.8 difference favoring the unis compared to totals. Uh, improved compared to preoperatively was statistically significant favoring unis and having the operation again favored the unis. And interestingly, the surgeons did not think that the partials were more technically demanding than totals. But we now have five-year results, exactly the same. Every outcome measure favors the uni. And most importantly, there was no difference at five years in the revision rate. So another um, evolution in our understanding was the effects of surgery. 90% of complications relate to the tibial failure due to bony overload. And this is my other important slide. So we've got indications looking at aiming for 20% if you want to do unis. And this is the second most important slide. And basically it shows what happens when we do surgery. And there's a, uh, the bottom one is a finite element analysis. The top one is Mike Berendt's uh, strain uh, gauge assessment or strain analysis, photoelastic analysis uh, of uh, strain after a uni. And you can see the strain uh, increases by 60%, maximum antromedial. Uh, it is a possible cause for the medial pain. With remodeling, this pain settles. So early postoperative pain should not be treated uh, with surgery. Don't do further surgery in a painful uni for at least one to two years because they will remodel. So what has happened is you've lost the tension band at the top. The uh, compressive part of the medial tibial plateau is under duress. And we've looked at this, so you get a further increased strain if you cut the posterior cortex. So don't do that when doing your vertical cut. If you uh, are too far medial with your vertical cut, in other words, you put a small tibia on, that is not good news. You must be as far laterally as you possibly can. And we will frequently recut laterally into the ACL to get the biggest tibia we possibly can. And finally, you mustn't go deep in the tibia. So we will never ever recut the tibia distally. 
If there's tight flexion gap, we go up into the femur. You must avoid these errors. So a big evolutionary part of the Oxford was the introduction of microplasty instrumentation. It was introduced to optimize tibial prep and component alignment. So we have spoons and G-clamps, so you get a very conservative tibial resection. That is very important in terms of avoiding failure and minimizing postoperative pain. And the femoral drill guide is linked to the IM rod for repeatable component positioning. So what is the evidence of the impact of this newer instrumentation? Well, there's a significant improvement in component positioning as uh, residents can be taught safely using this. 90% uh, of bearings are three or four, so very conservative uh, tibial resection, and we get a uh, reproducible uh, tibial resection, reduction in op time. And the one disadvantage of the mobile bearing with microplasty, the rate's been reduced to 0.1%. It really, on the medial side, is not an issue. Microplasty has been a game changer. The final e uh, evolution of the Oxford was the cementless. And we introduced this a long time ago because of radiolucent lines uh, with cement. And we were worried about misinterpretation. So the uh, femur has two pegs, uh, um, which is now common with cementless, uh, with cemented. Uh, there's porous coating and hydroxyapatite, but it's a spherical femur. The tibia is the same as the standard cemented tibia with porous coating and HA. So we uh, did a multi-center cohort study, a thousand unis, two centers, a 10 and 12 year survivorship, 97%. Uh, no difference between our center, designer center and the Christchurch center. And they uh, produced large numbers, at least half of all these people were from Christchurch. And what was really interesting was the radiolucent lines. They were massively reduced. There were no radiolucent lines in the vast majority of cases. Uh, well, there were no complete radiolucent lines, but only 7% had partial radiolucencies. So the temptation to revise for thinking that the radiolucency represented loosening uh, was abolished. What about registry results? Well, New Zealand and uh, UK is the same. You can see here, red cementless, green cemented. Uh, the revision rate is half uh, cementless Oxford versus cemented Oxford. I mean, this suggests that the cementless is better, but it may have been that the surgeon started with cemented and went on to cementless and therefore they were experienced. So we matched for this and the cementless is about 20% better than cemented. And the Oxford scores are significantly better. And then finally, uh, looking at uh, most up-to-date data. So this is looking at uh, the Oxford in the UK. They now subdivide cemented Oxfords from cementless. And this is comparing with what we would call the gold standard, the ZOOC. Uh, this is UK NCR data uh, 2019, and we've just had 2020, which is the same. So you can see that the Oxford cementless has the lowest failure rate, 5% uh, at 10 years, 95% survivorship. The ZUG um, was better very early on because there was no dislocation. You can see that at the bottom, but in a, you know, with careful technique, this shouldn't be an issue and hasn't been in India, but uh, there's a slightly higher failure rate uh, in the uh, between, after about seven years. And then we look at the Australian register and we can see the robots doing well early on uh, there isn't long-term data yet, and we're looking forward to hearing Martin's talk. Uh, they're doing very well, uh, the robots, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily need to have a robot to get good results. So the Oxford is now, uh, you know, we're talking about 25,000 uh, implants in the UK register. It is now the best performing uh, implant. So in summary, partials have many advantages to totals. Uh, you need to um, uh, realize this, and if you want to embrace unis, you need to accept that there's a high revision rate and accept that most surgeons do too few partials. And this is a huge uh, problem. This skews the results against unis. You need to understand indications. In India, you have huge numbers of patients with anteromedial osteoarthritis. Use the decision aid on your total knee patients and work out whether they could have a uni. Start doing some unis on them and get to 20%. Once you're there, some of you may go beyond, some of you, you may stay there. And unis are not for everybody. Broad indications don't compromise the results. Microplasty has simplified the technique and it's now much more reproducible. Tibial prep is the most challenging part of the surgery. So use sensible instrumentation. Cementing is critical, but cementless is the future. It is unbelievably good in the long term. So here's the take home message. As I said, you in India are very lucky if you wanna do unis. This uh, type of x-ray, I'm sure there are many more severe x-rays, but actually if you see this x-ray, you could do a total knee like the left, but all you need to do is look at the lateral, make sure there's retained bone posteriorly. 
implying the ACL is intact, do a uni and soon you'll be up to 20%. Thank you very much for your attention. Chris, that's a wonderful talk as usual. So given a nice synopsis of the Oxfords and we are a great fans of Oxford. We have been doing for the last three years and uh, Adash is the one who does it. Uh, Suhas, uh, we got any questions? There's one question in the chat box. This is for Dr. Chris Dodd. Uh, the summary of the question is you vindicated a patient for uh, a uni. Uh, once you open the joint, you see that there is thinning and fraying of the ACL. Uh, but when you do a Hooks test, it is intact. So is this a case for a uni or a total? That, to my mind, if the patient has anteromedial osteoarthritis, just to reiterate, bone on bone in the medial side and an intact ACL. That's the indication. It doesn't matter about the state of the ACL. It doesn't matter about their weight, their age, their activity, whether they have chondrocalcinosis, their obesity. You have diagnosed antromedial osteoarthritis. Now, obviously to begin with, you may be frightened about that. So what I would suggest young surgeons do, or any surgeon who's interested in unis do, is to start thinking about unis, perhaps do some unis, document the state of the intraarticular issues, if they have antromedial osteoarthritis, do the uni and follow your patients up and you will be absolutely amazed. Chris, it will be, you will be pleased to know that we have opened 3,000 or 4,000 knee replacements and we have photographed and documented and Adash has got the paper coming up. 35 to 40% of the total knee patients are amenable for unicondylar because of the AMOA. And all of them got intact ACLs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, many, many surgeons do say, and, and certainly everywhere in the world, they have always said, ah, oh, but our patients are so severe. They have gross deformity. And I'm sure Aaron, in the discussion, will talk about the issue of deformity uh, and the impact it has on whether a patient is suitable for uni and what happens to those patients after you do a uni on them. So uh, we will be interested to hear about that from, from uh, Arun. But basically the deformity doesn't matter. What matters is whether they have an intact ACL. It doesn't have to look normal. What matters is the x-rays. So again, go back to the x-rays. The reason for examining the patient, and I have to be careful here, of course, is you cannot diagnose hip arthritis on a knee x-ray. But you are again lucky, you have so little hip arthritis in uh, India that you could uh, almost ignore it. But anyway, I'm being facetious. What matters is anteromedial osteoarthritis and you diagnose it on x-rays. Nothing else matters. Two more quick questions. Oh, one more question, yeah. Yes, so one of the more common failures in uh, mobile bearing is poly dislocation. Yeah. So how do you prevent dislocation of the poly? Well, you, you need to be careful. Uh, it, it is interesting. If you look at India, if you look at uh, Asia, dislocation is very low. It is higher than uh, overall in the East, uh, sorry, in the West, because we don't have uh, full flexion in the majority of our patients. But when you look, the majority of surgeons don't have dislocations. What happens is a small number of surgeons have a rash of dislocations. They're told what the problem is. They either stop doing the mobile bearing and they then go to doing fixed, which is fine, or they start addressing the issues. It's entirely surgical. And once they start understanding uh, the issue of retained osteophytes and balancing and things like that, that's one of the reasons we introduced microplasty. There's an anti-impingement device now. You have to go after the posterior osteophytes, but it is a surgical issue. In high flexion, the femur sits over the central part of the tibia. Therefore, in high flexion on the medial side, the be mobile bearing is ideal. I mean, the fixed bearing is fine as well, but you need to be careful. But in, in India and in, um, in, the, in the East, uh, there are many surgeons, the majority of whom never ever have dislocation. So it is not obligatory. It's surgical. Chris, I agree with you. In fact, others, can you share how many Oxford you have done? We have got only one dislocation that is also last week. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we've done around, yeah, <laughs> we no. did around 170 Oxfords and we had our first poly spin out uh, last week. Yeah. Well, I'll I mean, be presenting that case. Again, surgical. It looked like it was a thin. Yeah. Yeah. Prob probably it was our mistake in the first place. I mean, not probably, well, definitely. 
Yeah, but that's not too bad. I mean, if you look at dislocation for a hip, I gather they say it's going to be about half to 1% uh, the patients are worn. So we've done a meta-analysis of all the published series and the dislocation rate with the mobile bearing is about 0.5%. With microplasty, it's now down to 0.1%. But I'm afraid every now and again, uh, things happen. And uh, you will in high flexion and in our countries. Uh, every now and again, you will get a dislocation. Maybe I could ask Arun. I don't know whether his... Um, how many have you had, Arun? And how many cases have you done? Uh, I'm going to present all that data, but okay. in, 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 in very brief, uh, in the last uh, uh, thousand odd cases, we've had about a 1% rate of dislocation. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's quite uh, high. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, uh, we've had 10, 10 cases. So that's what. Uh, in a thousand. Oh yeah, that's yeah. very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, so that's, my maths is not good. Uh, oh. it's it's point one percent. Yeah, point one percent, which is what yeah. it should be. Martin, yes, sir. Martin, have you done the Oxfords, or you're always uh, with Macos? No, I've done Oxfords. I'm I'm very very interested in Chris's data on the cementless, um, because. I think there is a transfer load to the tibia that we see in our cemented. And it would be interesting to hear from Chris, does he see their bony reaction or that anterior tibial pain a different timing or is that more minimized than you see with your cemented Oxfords? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem, Martin, is we, we didn't, when we did our randomized study, the one thing we didn't look at was early pain. We, we, our primary outcome measure was looking at radiolucent lines and, and the functional outcomes and the scores, we didn't look at early pain. Initially, our, our anesthetists, our anesthesiologists were telling us that they seem to have a bit more pain early on. Uh, uh, now we don't seem to see that so much. I mean, I, I'm really impressed with what we do to that proximal tibia. As soon as you cut off the proximal tibia, you've lost the tension band. And that poor old uh, proximal, uh, the, the compression part of the medial part of the uh, uh, compartment, that tibia, just wants to fall off. And it is challenged. And if you cut it too deep, if you cut it too medial, if you cut the posterior cortex, all the things we used to do so commonly, um, it seemed to be a problem and they all had pain. Now that we go so conservatively, uh, the pain has become much less of a problem. And my gut feeling is it's due to uh, tibial strain. And I think that, you know, you guys with a fixed bearing, you'll get onto cementless and, you know, you'll have some issues initially, but I, I think with total knees, you know, in 10 years time, I would suggest we'll all be doing cementless. That's the trend. Uh, got a question? Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of questions are polling, and I think we have probably question uh, time for one more question. There's been a trend in the UK registry where uh, fixed bearing is overtaking mobile bearing. Uh, it was 10% before, now it's almost reaching 15, 50%. So uh, any comment from Dr. Chris Dodd as to why the trend is changing towards fixed bearing mm -hmm. unit? Well, because, I mean, fixed bearing uni is a very good uh, prosthesis. It's a very good idea. If you look at total knees, the vast majority uh, are, are, are fixed bearing. And obviously, we've been going on about unis for so long now that the Oxford was really the only player in town. And um, what's happened is that as uh, unis have become more popular, um, um, all the other companies have become involved, and rightly so. Uh, and, you know, what's happened is that they've become an increasing market share. And you know, I would predict probably that, you know, at the moment around the world, the Oxford is still the most widely used, but probably, you know, very shortly, it'll be 50-50. And then you may say, well, what will happen in, um, you know, 10 years time? I, I don't think that's the issue. To me, it's never fixed versus mobile unis. The issue for me has always been partial versus total. Too many surgeons do total knees when they don't need to. And interestingly, in the UK now, the nice recommendation is that unless you talk to a patient about the probability or the possibility they could have a uni, then if something happens, they can be sued. So all surgeons now have to talk about unis. And this issue of 20% is transforming the debate in Canada, in certain parts, in per parts of Germany, in parts of Switzerland, 20% of all knee replacements are now unis. So at the moment, overall, it's less than 10%, but it's massively increasing. And in five years time, at least 20% of all knees will be unis. Before we take another question, Chris, Martin, can you, uh, Chris, can you stop the screen sharing? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, yeah. So uh, what do I need to do now? Uh, let's so, have a little look. Stop, share, yes. Stop, share, yeah. 
and uh, meanwhile by the time martin comes on to picture uh, i saw a question in the chat box is the strain on the tbi universal it, it has to be there all the time or is, is there any technique where we can negate the strain on the tbi yeah that's a very interesting question um we haven't really, and neither has anybody else, looked at the whole issue of uh, tibial strain in any great detail. What seems to happen is that ma the maximum strain is about two centimeters uh, underneath where we do the cut. And the lower that cut, the lower the strain is. And the other thing we found is, and people are beginning to look at that now, is that if you look at Asian patients and you draw a line down from the medial tibial spine, a significant proportion, that line will exit medially from the uh, medial uh, tibial cortex. In other words, you have significant uh, medial tibial overhang. We don't have that in our country. If you draw a line down from the medial spine, it exits somewhere down in the middle part of the tibia. So there's, there's many different issues at play here, but what seems to happen is if you lose the tension band, you're challenging that proximal tibia. And you really need to do all you possibly can, be careful surgery, conservative cut, put the biggest tibia you possibly can on, uh, and the patient is less likely to have issues. Thanks, Chris. Martin, mic is yours. Excellent. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yes. Yes, excellent. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, excellent talk as always, Chris. I learn as much from the technique as I do from the implant. I'm down in Florida. Um, my talk will be discussing uh, technology and does it make a difference in partial knee outcomes. Um, I am somewhat biased. We started uh, this back in 2005 and Stryker um, and I work with OrthoSensor as well. Um, and I'll walk you through my history and learning curve uh, as I went through this robotic. And we really look historically, as was said before, what are all the technical issues? I think now that the expansion of patients based on x-rays and exam has, have increased and we have excellent data that weight, age, height, et cetera, do not matter, then it's really up to us to perform the procedure appropriately. And I think it's hard, as Chris said, when guys start three-dimensionally understanding every effect, but the key I've really learned is minimize that tibia and keep that as strong as possible. Unfortunately, we don't have good databases in the United States, we're just trying, but what we do have is insurance um, databases. And so we pulled and reported on 35,000 patients, 13,000 were robotic and 21 were manual. And we did show that robotics did decrease the revision and the revision bur burden was lower. And I think if I look at the root of that, we don't have data on how many were done and when they were done in their teaching cycle. But as said before, I think if we can minimize the learning curve we could potentially increase the volume of successful unis. So we started back and performed in 2006. It was an inlay poly. And then in 2009, we launched the metal back. And that's been a learning curve, um, not only from the stable fixed bearing, but also the technique. And then what were our target zones that we were learning uh, a lot from the Oxford team telling us what our targets should be. And what we showed early on was improved alignment and we could prevent over under correction based on the patient's axis. Implant congruity could be minimized to minimize edge loading, gap balancing in the individual kinetics of the patient and improved execution of the pre-op plan. And with haptics, which protects us, allows us to not only have safety, but efficiency. My uni practice has opened up to buy unis, buy compartmental. And I do 10 years out, do a lateral uni on a medial that's stable. And Unfortunately, in the registries, they don't always pull out that adding a lateral uni is considered a revision when truly it's an excellent operation and has given that patient decades of relief. Um, recently, a saw application has been added, but this has been a high-speed burr application from the beginning. And this is one of the things that really interested me when I was doing manual unis is my inability to consistently get the slope whether it's three or six degrees, or do you recreate? And you can see on the left, the angular change, if you were to use an external jig, based on this person's slope and metathecial flare, is definitely a different angle to achieve if you're looking at the mechanical axis uh, using robotics and or any navigation. So preoperative planning initially was thought to be an added burden, but I've learned 
tremendous amounts of information from it. It gives me a full 3D reconstruction of the knee and allows me to see the patient's three-dimensional positioning. And as you see to the right, we have formats of where to place it, but we have the flexibility based on the patient's tibia vera and or their femoral position. So if you see here, I can pin it with the crosshairs laterally and add varus to the tibia vera, or if I've cut too much, I can change it by pinning it medially. So I have that flexibility and to see the patient's AP axis. As importantly, I can recreate the patient's slope. We've reported on variances of three to seven degrees, which is nice to recreate. As was said before, the largest tibia we see and we try to put it right on the cortex, make sure we're not undermining the ACL and see this three-dimensionally. And the critical part of this is minimize our tibial cut. And as was said before, I'm very comfortable going up and in on the femur. I don't see femurs fail in uni compartmentals. The other aspect is since we're tracking the knee, we have the opportunity to do added procedures through a mobile window. So here was a case we went in to do a uni, advanced lateral disease, as was said before, and I was able to do a bicompartmental, retain the ACL. Um, so we don't have to see the whole knee exposed because we're virtually tracking it. And when we looked at our data, what we found was when we put the CT scan and positioned the implant where we thought it should be, we changed and adjusted that three-dimensionally almost 86% of the time. And this was based on the patient's soft tissue as well as the target alignment we wanted to achieve. So I always look at knees as a flexible kinematic approach versus a fixed approach. And I think having flexibility does improve your opportunities. We can minimize the dissection. We don't need all the exposure, as I was said before. And I think this potentially not only psychologically helps the patient, but also not touching the extensor mechanism enables them to get up and get uh, their range of motion quicker. What the system allows me to do is you see to the left, the orange bars in the motion of the knee, the extension gap to the left, you could see was tighter. I could adjust that by proximalizing my femur and looking at my kinematics and rollback. I can also obtain the mechanical axis target zone that I want. And it's interesting when we look at our data, which I'll show, the end target zone doesn't have to be mechanically zero. Commonly, we'll leave it in varus. Now, the question will be how much varus and what's the correct ability. But I do um, also follow the Oxford teaching that we should not be releasing the medial collateral ligament as that could cause overstuffing of the contralateral compartment. And <clears throat> congruency through flexion, mid-flexion, and extension is obtained. And I see my x-rays the same, but more importantly, the kinematic motion. I do not try to achieve, um, if they have a slight flexion contracture, full extension. I found that's not opportune. And I try to also stay away from people with very hyperlaxed or significant recurvatum. That is not an ability to stabilize that knee, in my opinion, with a fixed bearing. The biggest learning curve and the biggest success for me actually has been lateral unis. They have a significant screw home mechanism going into extension. You can see to the left, these points are where the tibia is articulating on the femur. And commonly you're perfectly central posteriorly, but as you come into extension, you lateralize due to the screw home mechanism and you edge load. By pinning the tibia posteriorly, I can internally rotate the tip, sometimes behind the patellar tendon and obtain a centralized contact now. And so with the robotics, I can actually get behind the patellar tendon in the fat pad without having to <clears throat> cut through it. And my lateral unis for some reason have been extremely happy. And I see them commonly, unfortunately our arthroscopic surgeons in America still like to scope lateral meniscuses in older ladies who don't have a Rosenberg view. And the lateral uni you can do through a lateral incision um, and you can obtain all the angular contacts and range of motion needed. So that's been a very uh, successful procedure and has expanded in my practice. Haptics. Haptics is giving us three-dimensional and basically paint within the lines. You can see it's really turned me into almost an arthroscopic uni surgeon where I just look at the screen and I don't worry about uh, the soft tissue because I know it won't be affected you still have to plan your targets right, but you can efficiently three-dimensionally remove the implant material. Now, you have to understand, as was said before, you have to be very consistent with posterior osteophytes and any other osteophytes because this is not a saw. 
um, initially, and you can leave osteophytes behind that could affect your soft tissue. The other interesting thing I found is how do you quantify besides feel your flexion extension? This was a patient to the far left you can see came in unhappy with their uni. And fortunately for me, my assistant got a PA Rosenberg view and showed that I had overstuffed the flexion gap. So you have to think not only your mechanical axis is important, but also achieving alignment and balance throughout the range of motion. When we looked at our intraoperative data, meaning the obtained mechanical axis that we wanted to achieve, the question is, is that real? And can you see this postoperatively? And we were able to show with 200 patients that we had a 1.23 degree um, differential. Um, so if I left them in slight varus, I was consistently seeing them stand in slight varus. So I wasn't overcorrecting with standing x-rays postoperatively. So it allowed me to trust the intraoperative navigational targets. Bone preservation here is critical. And I keep going back to that as Chris did, because if you get down deep and there's been some mechanical discussions of five and a half or six, I, I personally think that's too deep. And I, in my hands with the fixed bearing, try to match the patient's tibia vera up to three degrees. Um, and from that, I don't always have to do a mechanical cut. If I want to uh, add another component through the cartilage mapping on the uh, graphic user interface, I can closely map the placement of the trochlea. So I have really good anatomic fit uh, with precision milling as well. So it gives me flexibility. And in some cases we are looking at tri-compartmental. Unfortunately, the cost prohibits this, but I do feel the ACL preservation is critical to the success of my unis as well as sometimes now my totals. So what's the data? Does the technology make a difference? And I think early on we showed that at two and a half years, we had a 99% success rate uh, with a very small revision rate. And the nice thing about this initially as with any new knee system, this is done with experienced surgeons, but the technology was new to them as well. When we looked at um, more of a larger study, um, Bell and Blythe in Scotland look at 139 patients and they did a blind, uh, level one blinded randomized controlled study. Um, they looked at their manuals versus robotics and did show that they were more consistent hitting their target zones with the robotic approach, which we would expect. Um, when they looked at the outcomes, two things came out early that they did have a little lower, 50% had lower pain. Now that's significant in terms of all of us have different pain protocols. Con conceptually, maybe the haptics, they had less soft tissue damage, but was shown also is that preoperative activity did affect postoperative outcomes as well. Um, Dr. Haddad looked at a single surgeon where he did 73 jig based or conventional versus 73 Mako partials. Once again, he saw a smaller pain um, and decreased postoperative pain medication. He also showed them get their physical therapy quicker and it may be due to the quad and quicker flexion. So there are opportunities as we add technology to enable this. And what's happened in the United States, I would say 98% of our partial knees all go home the same day now. We minimize their post-operative physical therapy and actually, if you leave the patients alone, they seem to have less pain. Now, what about survivorship? As was said before, we still obviously don't have the 20 year survivorship to the Oxford, but looking at the MAKO partial five year revision rate, um, and now I'll talk to you about the 10 year revision rate has been quite successful in registries. When we look at our five year data, we looked at a multi-centered um, cohort. And once again, two and a half, 98 percent, five and a half, 97 percent. And what I think this is really important is, is that we're now showing both fixed bearing as well as mobile bearing unis have good long term. And that's my biggest problem with my patients is almost convincing them that the uni is a better approach. I never have to tell them that a total is a good approach. They come in expecting that. So I would say my practice is about 30 percent uni compartmentals but I spend most of my time educating patients on this. And so as uni compartmental knee surgeons, I think we have to continue to document and show that our survivorship is not a early to a total knee, but their survivorship above now at 10 years in my cohort, 
learning curve. It's very quick. Um, Dr. Haddad just showed that a learning curve of six cases seems to be average. And the question now is cost effectiveness. Are you gonna invest in a high cost technology to give good outcomes? Besides the marketing effect, is there benefits? Quicker return to uh, work was shown uh, by Dr. Mont's group. Um, his return to work was six and a half weeks. We actually do see earlier return in some weeks. Revision analysis. So this was a large study by Dr. Mont's team. He looked at a large cohort, apologize for the noisy guys, and um, he found fewer revision procedures, shorter length of stay, and lower mean costs. So in clinical success, I think the technology in the robot has shown 97% survivorship at five to six, and now at our 10-year date is showing the same. And with more accurate ability to hit your target, I think younger surgeons who are getting into this, this will enable them to have successful outcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, you, <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. And so, Shahas, question from the chat box, please. Yeah, so, uh, so the first question is in terms of uh, your comfort level in how much slope in the tibia are you comfortable with? There are certain patients in the Indian population where there might be more slope than five to seven degrees. So would you suggest that we increase the amount of slope in the tibia? That's a great question. I struggle with that personally because we don't have good data about that. There's one um, fluoroscopic that showed greater than eight degrees does put stress on the ACL, but I would have to actually follow your data in achieving that. But if it's a true resurfacing, I think following the patient's slope up to about eight degrees is probably the max I would go. Uh, Martin, one minute. Somebody's uh, dog is barking. I think uh, if well, they can kindly uh, make it silent, it will be yes. much better. I apologize. Okay, Martin, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, Martin, it, but it, you got unmuted. Yeah. So, ask okay. next question. So, the, the, the other question is in terms of learning curve uh, with reference to robotic, there is a difference between in terms of the accuracy you attain versus being time neutral. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. I, I think the accuracy is consistent. So whether it's your first case or your hundredth case, it, you'll hit your target zone every time. In terms of timing, it does add time to your surgical procedure. Uh, putting the arrays in, making sure that the um, registration is appropriate. But my time neutral is about 35 minutes now. So I'm usually consistent with my manual unis. So as we will hold it there because we are sure. running late. We will We'll expand by another 30 minutes, no issues, uh, with the permission of all the faculty. Uh, I think I can see Emmanuel theme point on the screen. Am I right? Emmanuel, yeah, you're there? Dr. Emmanuel has joined us, yes. Right. Would yeah. you like to go or want Marun to talk? Emmanuel, team point, can you hear us? Share my screen. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? No, we can hear you, but we can't see you. No, I have a weak I have a weak internet connection, so I will keep the screen off during the presentation. I will switch it on afterwards. Yeah. So I, I don't want any technical problems. Thank you. So you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Right. Hi guys, thank you for the invitation. So um you asked me to um talk about why do partial knees fail, prevention and management, and make sure that uh the youngsters are not too afraid of this uh, type of um, arthroplasty. Well, for that reason, uh, I want to start with the question, do they really fail? Um, because of course we know that uh, there is a higher revision rate, but uh, as I will show you um, in, in the coming slides, um, uh, there are many subjective surgeon reasons to, uh, to do this. Um, more technically challenging because of smaller incision and surfaces and you have to master your technique. And I think I can agree with uh, Martin, that is that um, probably robotics is going to help you, especially 
if you don't have the experience to start. Um, there is also, I believe, in uni more subjective, you're more subject to patient-related factors like osteoporosis, obesity, which BMI is okay. And, and I, I personally relate it more to the osteoporosis and the overall alignment. It's difficult sometimes in very small knees, as you know, um, and also in stiff knees. So you see that uni have, has several factors um, that might make it more difficult than when you do a total knee. Now, the question uh, we believe you have to ask is, um, is it uh, a discussion of function over survivorship? And you all know that the ones uh, who are doing unis, you have a functional outcome that is often difficult to reach with your total knee. But of course, if you look at the statistics, you see that the survivorship of the uni is sometimes lower. So we wrote this in an editorial a few years ago, Andrea Baldini and myself, and we said, do we have a clue? Because there are so many factors in favor and against. Now, if you have this type of patient, you can do two types of treatment. You can treat them with this unicompartmental, in this case, a fig bearing, or you can do a total knee and you can even try to uh, recreate uh, some anatomic joint line. And then you can say that this is the, the most anatomic solution for your patient. We still don't know it. The, I think today the people on the webinar are believers, but of course, if you would have a, a webinar with only disbelievers, they would of course have many arguments to say that we don't have to do this. Now, uh, in, in 215, I asked David Murray uh, for one of my partial knee meetings where we're doing a supplement to write a paper with the title, uh, Unicompartmental Knee, is the glass half full or is it half empty? And it is something um, that I often use in my practice. I Today, I draw a glass and I, I fill it in half and I ask the patient, is it half full or is it half empty? Because if he sees it half empty, he might see the uni as only partial work and he believes that you are missing out on two thirds of his compartment. If he sees it as half full, it's maybe an optimist and he sees uni as conservative surgery that is saving the rest of his joint and keeping ACL, PCL intact, the two other, two other parts of the joint. And especially as I tell my, my residents and fellows, you keep that lateral site intact, which is often very complicated to reconstruct um, biomechanically with open knee. Now, I admit, partial knee asks for decisions. Um, and when you are going for a decision, um, you have to ask yourself three questions, as David Murray stated in that paper. The first thing is a treatment should be safe. That means you offer a minimum risk of complications to the patient. And as you can see here, medical comorbidity. And I believe this is very important because where can you go if you're a fragile patient and you get a, a perfect total knee and you die during the hospitalization? Um, of course, your survival will be forever, but I don't think this is what you were looking for. The second point, as David stated, was a treatment should be effective. And he listed you should reduce pain, increase function, make people go back to work earlier if they're young, go back to normal daily life and sports if they want. And then finally, your solution should think about the next intervention. And there should be a minimal risk for it if you have to do it. I give you an example. A few years ago, I had a patient who came to see me and he had medial compartmental joint osteoarthritis. And he just had seen the guys in Germany and they proposed to him a cemented hinge. And I told him, I think we can do a uni. So both of us were seeing the same type of patient with the same demands. I proposed him a uni. The German colleagues who are great surgeons and great friends proposed the hinge. And the guy opted for the uni because he said, I'm only 60. If I have to get a revision, revising this cemented hinge might be more difficult, except if he would go back to the same hospital. But he said, I will prefer the uni. And I did the surgery and he's still happy. Now, another point would be total knee never fails then, because you asked me to explain that uni sometimes fails, but total knee never fails. Well, Pete Sharkey checked it in 2002 
And the three main indications were basically aseptic losing instability and infection. And if it, they looked in, in that register study at the 50% early revisions, they saw that the main causes were instability, malalignment, and failure of fixation. So we realized that this is related to surgical technique. Now, 10 years later, Pete asked his fellow um, from the same institute to check the same topic. And he came up with these results. Again, aseptic loosening, again, instability, again, infection. We saw that early revisions were slightly down from 50% 10 years before because there was a better surgical training. But here we're talking about total knee guys. So I don't, I don't think you have to uh, believe that total knees never have a problem. Of course, if you only talk to experts and you have guys um, who are doing a few hundreds a year, of course they can manage it, but they can manage the uni as well. Now, we could say total knee patients are always doing perfect. We have maybe some complications, I agree, but still they're always happy. Well, if you look at an overview of literature, you can see that on average, about 20% of the patients are not so happy with the total knee. So that's the reason why everyone is always looking for a new technical solution. And if you look at revision as an endpoint, and I agree most of the time, we look at um, revision even excluding deep infection. And then you can say for a total knee that it's like 99%. However, if you start to add other causes of revision, you start to look at if they're satisfied or not, and if they have pain, then you end up with about 70% who is really satisfied, uh, which you could say, if you were as eager to revise total knee as people are eager to revise unis, well, you could revise 30% of them. So these are a few points to make you understand that not only the uni fails. Now, I had the pleasure a few years ago to, um, during a big meeting that we organized to do a survey on, on surgeons. And we showed them an X-ray of a, a isolated bone on bone medial compartment osteoarthritis. And I, I asked the guys, the surgeons, I said, what would you like if this was your knee? And as you can see here, 87% of the polled surgeons and these were 600 surgeons said, I would like a uni for myself. However, when I showed the same x-ray on the next slide, and I said, this is your patient, they only 78% replied that the patient would get a uni. So this showed that for the same x-ray, surgeons would like a uni for themselves, but 9%, about 10% of the guys, wouldn't propose it to the patient and would put a total knee, that way they would themselves like a uni. So this was a funny observation. Now, of course, we know if you compare the statistics, you can see that every 10 years, the rate of uni revision goes up and there are several causes and 3.5 time, times more revision if you look at registered data. Now we know, and maybe this was touched upon, um, some people just are more aggressive to revise a uni. And if you look at this uh, study by Baker and you see the reasons why um, unis were revised, um, there are a lot of su subject subjective things. Loosening up to today, and we, are, we have this in publication, in, in review, um, we still have no definition of what is exactly loosening. And I still see many patients at my clinic that come with a bone scan, which is hot, like six months after an operation. And some surgeon told them, because the other guy with the operation was maybe not his friend, that this was loosening. Please never diagnose loosening only on a bone scan. Unexplained pain, high, very high rates to revise a uni. Um, dislocation instability, infection. These are the reasons we also see in total knee. So I think that um, if we take out the, subject, the subjective reasons of revision, um, it's probably going to be more or less the same as for a total joint. Now, some classic reasons where we as surgeons have to try to to um, find the right indication is disease progression. This is in literature, of course, explained as overcorrection, but I think this is the easy way out. I think that some people have mechanical osteoarthritis and these are perfect patients forever to be treated with the uni. And then you have people who have like more a metabolic or an inflammatory arthritis, and they will always still be at risk to develop 
some disease in other compartments. I don't think you can only link that to overcorrection. This is too classic. Then we have dislocation. Dislocation is, of course, a rare complication. Um, in the fixed bearing, it's even more difficult to see, but in, I believe in the mobile, sometimes it happens, but it's very rare. Then we have loosening. You can see that this can happen in an old poly or also in a fixed bearing it is known as radio loosenses in, in the mobile. And sometimes this is classified as what we call loosening. But as I said, please reconsider what is really a definition of loosening and don't, don't reoperate any patient who has a radio loosency because you might be disappointed and have uh, eat some hours to get a very loose implant out. And that always makes me make me laugh when I hear this from people. Now, finally, you can also have some anteromedial bone pain in overload or some collapse, as you can see, or fractures. Um, this is technical if you uh, make a too low cut, as you see here on the right side. This is a, a very good surgeon, but he's doing a 99.9% .9 total knees, and he did one uni. Uh, he sent it to me, he said, your uni doesn't really work. I said, mm, maybe you had some technical problems because if you see where the joint line cut was, um, and then you, you might, of course, suspect that this is not going to be very successful for this patient. Now, we, we don't want to discuss, it was one of the questions you asked me and to, to discuss the difference between fixed and mobile. I personally don't think there is a difference. I think we should discuss um, uni against total knee. Um, and I think that both fixed and, and mobile are doing well. However, um, as a fixed bearing user, I think I have, a, I have a little bit more easy for my extended indications. And I show you a few. Um, the lateral uni, I can do it with the same system as my medial one. So I don't have to change to do the lateral ones. So that makes it a bit easier. I can do it also in a, a patient without ACL. I don't have to be afraid of this location. You see here postural medial wear. So only with the x-ray, you can see that the ACL is gone. Well, when we do the reconstruction, we, we give the patient some upslope and you balance it perfectly in flexion. And then you can, uh, you can give him some stability back. Uh, and, and this is a, a difficult, but still an extended indication. After osteotomy, we all know that after osteotomy, the joint line obliquity changes. You see here that it's more or less parallel. Sometimes it's even inverted. And that sometimes there is some laxity on the lateral ligament because of that osteotomy. Well, with my fixed bearing, I don't really have to worry if I have some laxity. Um, so this allows me to do this operation in some patients. And then, of course, I can combine. Um, uh, you see here, lateral uh, uni combined with the telephermal, medial, and bi uni. The indication of bi uni is very rare. We see it a lot with our friends in Italy. But personally, I think um, it's very rare because patients are either varus or valgus. And so, you almost need a, a, a neutral aligned patient who got a lot of help from surgeons that pulled out this menisci and then they debrided the cartilage and they, they did some laser surgery. And you need, you need some iatrogenic help to find these indications. In, in my experience, it's very rare. This patient tricompartmental, I wanted to show you because this was the, the patient who, who made me shift to, uh, to this, this belief that uni was a good solution because I saw this lady at my clinic one day and um, she said, uh, you will have to revise my total knee on the other side. Uh, it's in there for eight years, but uh, it's loose and it's painful and unstable. And uh, she said, why didn't they do the same operation as, as what I got on the left side? And I said, what did they do on the left side? And I sent her to the x-ray and she came back with this x-ray. And I said, who the hell did this in Belgium? I, I'm not aware of anyone. She said, no, 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 I was not a Belgian. He was a French professor. I, I got operated by him, but I think he's already dead. Of course, he's not dead. It was Philippe Cartier, and he's still alive and kicking, and he was at our partial knee meeting last year. And uh, Philippe did this operation, and it's now, you won't believe me, but it's true, 45 years after the operation. It's probably the poly was plastic. It was done without any instruments. And you don't see anything. You don't see any loosening. You don't, nothing is happening. And I believe it was because ACL and PCL are intact. I revised the other knee. I had to put in a, a hinge and she loves it as much as the tricompartmental. And I think this is a secret 
And um, Martin knows that if you keep ACL, PCL intact, you can get the same outcome. So uh, more or less you need track compartment like this and Hinge, we, we are doing the same. We are keeping ACL, PCL intact or we are substituting for them. Now here you see, um, you, you asked me uh, on fixed or mobile, I think the survival curves are very close. You can compare this with patellofemoral joint. You see that there are much more revisions and I can only state that you have to think about a painful uni when you really want to revise it. The PPK, partial knee, persona partial knee, which I designed with many other guys, um, just came out with results of the UK National Joint Register. And you see that it has um, the lowest rate. Of course, it's one year out. Um, we, we will start to uh, have parties once we are 40 year out like the Oxford. Now, final point for me, when you talk about revision and failure, um, please remember that there is a big difference between revising a, a, a little bit painful uni with, a, with a, this type of uh, total knee, or you're doing a real failure with massive osteolysis. The rule in general, as I published in BGJ, is that if you are down 10 millimeters from the lateral side on a medial one, then you will get in trouble. Then you need to use uh, wedges, today cones. And at my time when I did this revision, uh, a longer stem uh, with some offset, which is a little bit like the cones we use today, but this was um, avant la lettre, you know, uh, Martin at our age, we, 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 know how, we, we knew how to solve these things before uh, the, the companies came up with uh, new technology. So for the youngsters, why consider uni after what I've explained? Well, I think it's the only uh, intervention where you can keep ACL, PCL, both intact and you can have like normal biomechanics of the knee. Um, it is clearly an intervention that leads to less mobility and less mortality. Um, and I think this is really an important point for elderly patients. Um, they, wanna, they wanna have a, an arthroplasty with good function, but of course they wanna survive and they wanna tell all their friends about how good they are doing and nice work that the Oxford group did to show that. 20% um, of total knee patients have chronic pain. Um, we are doing a study now where if you have uh, a patient that had a, a painful total knee and they're quite unhappy and they came to see us um, for advice and I decided not to revise that knee as a second or third opinion. Um, if they come back to us for the other side, we are doing now a uni and we wanna see of these patients at risk for chronic pain if they do better with the uni, it could be the fact that the uni will be the secret for them. Now, another point is also the outcome. You all know about the forgotten joint score, uh, which is a fantastic score with uh, 12 questions that are that is evaluating how patients are doing. Um, I was lucky to have this score. Uh, the, the very first publication that was sent to me as a reviewer so I saw this score even before I accepted the paper and it was published. And I said, wow, this is fantastic. We have to use this score. Um, and published a few papers in, in the meantime also on this. Um, and I can only advise all of you to use it because it's a very simple and very useful score. And we did a study where we looked at uh, pre-op joint awareness in knee and hip, because as you all know, hip, knee, hips do usually better than knees. So we looked at the pre-op score. We said maybe the secret is that hips start at a higher point. But basically, as you can see, both hip and knee have the same uh, forgotten joint score before surgery, and we didn't find any difference. Now, when we look at the post-op score, you can see that the hips are doing better overall than the knees, despite that the effect size is more or less the same. So we said, how is this possible? Where does this come from? And then we looked at different genders, and we saw that male patients with a hip are doing extremely well. And that is why the average score um, in, a, in a hip group where you have 50% males and 50% females, usually your hip scores are higher. In the knee, you have 70% females and 30% males, and the males are not doing that good. So basically what you get is you get an effect size, which is the same, but you get a difference, a statistical difference if you compare male patients with a total knee versus total hip. And then I said, maybe we can find a solution with the uni. And here you can see that uh, uh, with the uni, you can have a score of 
80.5, and the normal patient without an arthroplasty for their age has 82. So we are almost getting to the forgotten joint with the uni in a male patient. And I believe it's because they are more active, they are using their joint much more, and they really hate it when ACL and PCL are gone. And these are the patients often you see young males, and I, I consider young males and any male under 60 or 65, because uh, uh, as you know, when your own age progresses, you, you consider people younger when they are more your age. Um, so, and I think that these younger men, they sometimes end up with, uh, with a joint which is swollen, and then everyone wants to call them infected, but you can never find a germ. If they are really aggressive surgeons, they will rip it out and revise it for an infection, which is never proven. But I think it's ACL, PCL absence, and that it leads to some synovitis and swelling. Now, doing a uni for the young surgeons, it will be much more difficult guys than just doing total knee. And you will need to consider a few factors. First, what is the patient profile? Which type of patient are you operating? Are you doing this young male or are you doing an elderly, female, low demand, uh, obese lady? What is this profile? It is a typically Mechanical osteoarthritis, these are the ones I would advise you to do first. That would be a post meniscectomy patient who has varus from the intraarticular side, no metaphysial uh, varus, and not, not too much bowing, not too much varus. It comes from the operation, the meniscus operation created this osteoarthritis. You do unis in these male patients, they will love you and they will send all, your fr all their friends. Then it depends on your technical capacity, of course. If you have problems with your saw, stay away a little bit from, from the uni or start using, uh, or start using for example, um, the robot as, um, as Martin has taught us. Then look at the function of this patient. I don't think you have to push uh, patients to do a uni. If you have like, a, if you have like a, a patient who has only 80 or 75 degree of flexion, forget it, don't touch them. Do you think you will need a revision in the next time, in the future? And then finally, an important point if for the younger surgeons is peer pressure. If the guys around you, your colleagues in the same department, they hate unis. If the surgeons in the hospitals next to you, they hate unis, don't start with it. Because as soon as they will believe that they can show you that you did a, a bad choice, they will revise it. So think about this. If you have a, if you have a group of believers, like in my, in my team, all the young surgeons, they start unis because they know I will always back them up. And I think this is important. Now, why, why is not everyone thinking about doing unis? You could, you could say that. Well, I had the pleasure to, to work with Filip Rosinski, who is the coach of, uh, really a pope of mental coaching. Um, and Philippe, uh, after uh, going through some medical experiences, told me that there are diff different type of surgeons and we are not all the same. And he classified it, it's published, you can find it for free online. And he said there are surgeons who have a high level of technical excellence and then a high level a sense of caring and that really care about the patients. And so basically, if you are technically low and you don't really care too much about how the patient will do, this is what we call a disconnected surgeon and you will just do whatever suits you and never think to have a patient-specific treatment. If you are not technically so good, but you care a lot, you're a nice surgeon. These, these are very popular. I mean, these are the guys talking about the family. They know the names of the grandchildren and the patient, even if it ends up with a bad result, they will always love that surgeon. Then you have competent surgeons, but not such a high sense of caring. These are guys that sometimes we call arrogant, they may be not so popular. They are doing one operation, never thinking about anything. They are really great at total knee, but always do the same total knee, uh, the same implant, the same, the same angulation, the same type of surgery, always on every patient, on a, on a 50 year old male or on a 92 year old female. And then I think this is the final group where you all want to be the remarkable surgeon. This is a guy who really thinks about sense of caring, wants to find a patient specific solution, the best solution for his patient. He's thinking about how to get that, how to do what he can for them, and hopefully he will reach it. And these are the guys, and there are many online, I can see their faces. Um, these are the guys who are doing uni because they remarked at some stage in their career 
that they needed to do to offer something else. Now, how can you get there? This is a slide I got from, uh, from Chris Dot. If you are ready and you can increase the ratio of unis, you will see that uh, you get better at it. You will get better at the indication and you will get better at the technical execution. And this will make a big difference for you. Don't get overexcited. Um, this is also a slide I got from David and probably also from Chris. If you push your indications too much, and I mean by that, not the patients that are coming from all the country to you because you do unis, then it's normal that you have a high rate. But if you are really looking for a uni everywhere and you start to do it on 20 degree varus knees and you do it on very osteoporotic ladies and you do it, then you will get into trouble again and you will have a higher failure rate. So I would advise you to stay within this 20 to 40% of your cases um, and then it will be, it will be the, 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 right, the right percentage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. It's a very interesting talk. I wish all of us are in that uh, remarkable surgeon group which you showed. Thank you so much. Uh, is your internet okay now? Can you come on to the video as well? I think probably we'll go to Arun's talk and then we'll take a questions at the end. And with all your permission, okay. we'll extend this by another 20 minutes. Arun, are you ready? <clears throat> yes, I'm ready. Uh, if you can take off the previous uh, screen, Emmanuel, uh, stop sharing, please. Emmanuel, can you stop the screen sharing, please? Yeah, I think he's doing that. Yeah, okay. So, Arun. So, the plan is uh, we will let Arun talk about the Indian uh, journey, which is very relevant to all of us. And then we will uh, have a discussion. And then, or even probably I'll see, we'll ask two presenters to present the cases and then club the discussion at the end so that all the people will be participating. So we'll see how it goes. Marun. So I don't know why I'm not able to share the screen. Uh, let me try. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got, got it, it now. Yep. Got it. All right, great. So yeah. thank you so much, Guruva and Hemant. And it was great uh, to listen to Chris, uh, Martin, and Emmanuel. They made my job easier because a lot of points have already been discussed. So um, my journey with uni started in 1997. And this is the first uni that I performed. Uh, it was a fixed bearing uni in a, a lady who was in her late 50s at that time. And I had the pleasure of uh, meeting her again uh, in January of this year, 22 years later. And the x-rays are shown uh, below. You can see the lateral compartment still has adequate cartilage. There is some minimal radiolucency, but the components are good. She's walking well. She's uh, very happy with it. She had in between come and I had done her other knee about 15 years ago. And that was an Oxford uni at that time. So this is when I started my journey about 23 years ago with unis. And this is how it's progressed. Initially, they were fixed bearing unis uh, for the first uh, several years till the Oxford unis became available. And thanks to Chris and David who came and did the first uh, Oxford course in Mumbai with me. And then uh, I started doing the Oxfords from 2005 onwards. And more recently, because I uh, do all my total knees navigated, I had the software for uh, fixed bearing knees, which uh, allowed me to navigate these as well. So I've started doing fixed bearings again in the last few years. So the indications have already been covered and I don't think I'll uh, spend too much time on that. Uh, we know that it should be bone on bone contact, uh, which corrects with a valgus stress and that the lateral space should be intact. The wear should be anterior medial. And we've shown that the wear pattern correlates with the integrity of the anterior cruciate ligament. And we published this some years ago. How intact should the ACL be is something that I think Chris uh, alluded to a little earlier. 
Uh, in a younger patient, I would like it to be intact and maybe a low demand elderly patient, uh, I might compromise and perhaps use a fixed bearing. This was a uh, paper which the Oxford group had shown for many years that if the ACL was absent, uh, you can see in the, the green line, the survivorship was lower. But I believe this was not really the graph for uh, medial unis as much as for bicompartmental unis which were being performed in Oxford at that time. Uh, the lateral patella facet should be intact as also the lateral compartment. In our cases, we see a lot of patients with flexion deformity and these should be less than 10 degrees. And as Emmanuel mentioned, the knees should flex uh, substantially, they shouldn't be stiff. How much of varus can be acceptable is a matter of debate, 10 to 15 degrees, possibly less than 10 degrees would be appropriate, uh, but it should be correctable. Even if it is more than 10 degrees, it should be correctable. This was a study that we did on cruciate ligaments and beyond 10 degrees, uh, there is some structural change which we found on immunohistochemistry and on histology uh, with some changes occurring in both the ACL and the PCL. Also, uh, we in, a, in one of our publications looked at alignment after unis, especially the Oxford unis, and we found that the greater the uh, pre-op deformity, uh, the less the correction would be achieved. So you might have a, a very severe deformity remaining in some degree of varus. Large pre-op deformities may remain in residual varus. And this is the uh, uh, graph which shows that if you had something like 165 degrees of varus, it may remain in some degree of post-op uh, varus as well. And the exclusion criteria, at least for the mobile bearing would be a prior HTO, uh, inflammatory arthritis and extreme obesity, which uh, the Oxford group suggests may not really be relevant. How much wear is acceptable in the patellofemoral joint is a question that is frequently discussed. Um, and uh, I think uh, we've already looked at this study, which Chris mentioned, uh, where when they looked at Cozen and Scott contraindications, such as younger age, a greater weight, and a high activity level, as well as exposed bone in the PFJ, for the American Knee Society scores, with and without the contraindication, there was no significant difference and likewise for the Oxford knee score, suggesting that these may not be very relevant. And in fact, the 15 year survivorship with and without the contraindications did not seem to be any different. In the initial years, we had looked at our own uh, results in terms of functional recovery, as well as the radiographic results of unis, and we'd published this the mean HK was 172, and we were able to bring it down to a mean of 177. Uh, a more recent uh, study that we did, we published in uh, ACTA Orthopedica, where we looked at what is the sort of alignment that we get in a uni. Does it mimic that of the unaffected side? Now, obviously we don't know what the deformity in that particular limb is uh, before the disease uh, takes place. So what we did was to compare uh, patients where the opposite knee was reasonably normal, in other words, less than grade two Kelgren Lawrence and were clinically asymptomatic in the opposite limb and compared them with the other side where we did a uni. The HKA angle on the normal unaffected side was 176, on the HKA side was 177 mean. The, uh, and here you can see there was a very high correlation, 0.6, between the HKAs of the two limbs. 
when we looked at the weight pairing uh, axis and the relationship to the Kennedy and White zones, uh, we could see that the normal side shows you know, the green graph and the operated uni side is the orange graph. And you can see that there's a very great similarity between uh, the, uh, on the two sides with, regarding, with regards to the weight pairing axis. In other words, we are able to replicate the weight pairing axis similar to the unaffected limb. And lastly, we looked at the knee joint line obliquity with respect to the floor. And here too, the uh, values were not significantly different. In other words, we were able to mimic the obliquity as well. Now looking at some of our results, the, this is a patient uh, which, uh, whom we had operated in 2005, and this is the 10-year follow-up uh, x-rays of this patient. We did a minimum 10-year follow-up study of our mo mobile bearings. And this is the uh, data on these patients. 106 unis with more than 10-year follow-up. Several had died, some were untraceable. And we had 76 unis uh, who were interviewed on the phone by four of my fellows. And uh, two were reoperated for a bearing fracture and one had been revised for OA progression, giving something a little more than 97% survivorship. But more importantly was their uh, telephonic questionnaire asking them about their satisfaction level. And this is more important when we look at the 20, 30% dissatisfaction rates with total knee replacement. Here you can see that with, um, with our unis, we had a very good uh, um, uh, satisfaction rate, only two to 4% was somewhat dissatisfied and the others were very happy when we looked at their overall result and we asked them about pain, their activities indoors as well as outdoors. <clears throat> now, when we looked at our last thousand unis, we paid a little more attention to various aspects and I'd like to present some of this data to you today. Uh, of these, we are looking at those who completed two-year follow-ups. We have data available on nearly 900 of these patients. This is their age distribution by gender. And you can see that there are more females than males. And the females tend to be um, slight, perhaps not much of a difference in their age groups. But the difference is there in BMI between the two genders. And you can see females, that is the orange bars, uh, are tending to be more obese than our male patients. <clears throat> These are the pre-op values for HKA, the hip, knee, uh, ankle axis, pre-op and post-op. And you can see the spread, the box and whisker plots showing roughly around 122 degree pre-op, correcting to about 177 post-op. Again, we looked at the weight bearing axis and which Kennedy white zones this falls through. Uh, Preoperatively, most of them were on the medial half of the tibia, zero, one, or two. And post-op, you can see most of them are centered around uh, the zone two, which is where we would like it to be. Again, in this much larger cohort, we found a similar negative correlation between the degrees of correction obtained and the pre-op HKA. In other words, the greater the deformity that was existing before surgery, you got more correction in those cases and less correction if the deformity was much closer to 180 degrees. A lot of our patients also demonstrated significant bowing in the femur uh, and also some degree of reverse bowing. So you could see to the left side of the chart, two, three, and four degrees were there in a substantial number of patients as also patients with more than six and seven degrees of VCA, the valgus correction angle. In other words, femoral bowing was quite prevalent. 
Now, when we look at our deformities, and this is where Chris raised the question of extraarticular deformities and uh, alignment both pre and post uni. The blue charts are the preoperative uh, alignment, and the orange charts, uh, orange bars, are with uh, extraarticular deformity in the femur. Uh, that's on the left. Then tibia, femur, and tibia. And on the extreme right, when there is no extraarticular deformity, we did a ANOVA test on these, and we found that the preoperative deformity as well as the post-op HKA were no different with or without extraarticular deformity. In fact, we also looked at the number of outliers we had in each of these groups with and without extraarticular deformities in the femur, tibia, and both, and in neither. And this is the spread that you can see. This is if we consider outliers beyond 174, uh, uh, less than 174 and more than 180 degrees. And if we take outliers, uh, if we consider 178.5 as our target, and we take 1.5 degrees on either side. So again, this is the spread of outliers that you can see. We did have some which were overcorrected into uh, valgus. And that's where perhaps we need to uh, be a little more attentive to our surgical technique and perhaps our patient selection. Now, what was very interesting, and Chris, you will see this correlation uh, between the MPTA, the medial uh, plateau, the, the medial angle between the tibial uh, plateau and the long axis of the tibia, the anatomical axis, is said to be around 87. So we've grouped these bars based on what was the pre-op MPTA. <clears throat> In other words, how much of metaphyseal tibial varus was present. And this seems to have a significant correlation with the post-op HKA. In other words, the greater the varus of the tibia, the more likely that they would have various post-op. Now we're looking at some of our VAS scores. So let's look at the patient outcomes in these patients. This is the VAS score, and uh, this is pre, one, and two-year follow-up. Um, this is across age groups now. So the blue bars are the pre-op pain scores. Um, then you have the orange uh, bars, which are at one year and two years. So you can see a substantial improvement in pain, and this is across all age groups. Again, an analysis of variance showed that the VAS scores were really no different, both preoperatively as well as postoperatively in, uh, as regards ages. So whether the patients were young or elderly or middle-aged, they all had fairly similar pain scores. They were not significantly different from each other at the various points in time. Likewise for pre-op HKA. So you could see that there was no real significant difference preoperatively, whether the deformity was greater or lesser. And uh, likewise at the one year and the two year follow-ups. However, between one and two year, follow-ups, there was some substantial improvement, not only in the pain scores, but also the Oxford scores. Now, Chris mentioned 30 odd uh, is a good post-op Oxford score. And here you can see a large number of them between 40 and 48 and 30 and 39 uh, at the one and two year follow-up periods. So you can see a substantial improvement in the Oxford scores. Uh, with these patients. All these scores have been collected by our research secretary who has uh, independently contacted these patients both during their follow-up visits as well as uh, telephonically uh, on these questionnaires. This is the Oxford knee score across different age groups. Again, no significant difference because of age. However, there is an improvement between even one and two years in the Oxford knee scores, and that is significant. 
Again, with the deformity, there seems to be no correlation. This is again now the SF12 scores showing a substantial improvement between the one and the two year period in the SF12. This, these are the WOMAX scores for a pre, post, and one, uh, one and two year post-op. And uh, let me now come to a few cases of our complications and revisions. So we've had one case of aseptic loosening of both components. Uh, we did not think it was infected, but it could have been. We have had one revised for pain and two uh, infections in our series requiring a washout and bearing exchange. We've had one patient with progression of uh, osteoarthritis, particularly in the patellofemoral uh, joint, the lateral patellofemoral uh, compartment, as well as a lateral tibiofemoral compartment. And this patient had to be revised, converted to a total knee replacement. This was after 14 years. This was an unusual patient, a, a lady who had Bilateral unis was very good for the first three years and then suddenly developed rheumatoid arthritis. It could be that we had not diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis or she developed it after the surgery was performed and both needed to be converted to a total knee replacement. We've had a total of 10 bearing dislocations in 1465 cases. Nine were reoperated with a one millimeter thick insert, and two have been converted uh, to a TKR. Sorry, this should be 11, uh, I think. 11 bearing dislocations. Most of them require just a one millimeter thicker insert. This is one of our earlier fixed bearing knees, which was done way back in uh, the early 2000s period where there's loosening of the tibial component is the fixed bearing um, reservation uni uh, all poly tibia. This was a patient uh, operated elsewhere and this is a common complication that occurs if you're not careful uh, with the drill holes or with impaction or as Chris mentioned possibly damage to the posterior cortex and uh, this requires conversion to a total knee replacement with a stem as well as an augment. So uh, the take home message really is that don't be fixed in your thinking. Don't think that total knee replacement is the only option for these patients. Both mobile and fixed bearing unis are suitable options for indicated patients if they are done correctly and regularly. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. <clears throat> That's a wonderful insight into that. If you stop uh, screen sharing, we will go to Adesh. Uh, we will get to the presenters, and then we will wrap it up and join the discussions. Because I'm sure the presenters will pose new questions to you. And thanks, Emmanuel. I can see you, that you are driving the car. And uh, so be careful. Oh, my driver is driving. Okay, that's I, fine. I, okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, right. Adesh, uh, open your screen, please. So the, we got a, four presenters, and we will uh, give them quick time. Yeah, Adesh is from Sunshine Hospitals. That is where I work. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen and hear me. Yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. Adash from Sanchan Hospitals. Uh, so I'll just start off my case discussion. First, I'd like to say uh, I met all these great faculty in Bruges uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, Professor Dodd, Professor Thienpont, and Dr. Roche at the Partial Knee uh, uh, Conference. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have them here with us today. And uh, just to summarize in our experience with unis, uh, we started a little bit um, on the tentative side, we weren't too sure whether we wanted to do them, but now we've performed around 200 in the last two years. We're doing Oxford's as well as the Mac Oristoris joint. We're very happy with the results, but as you know, 
sometimes there's always going to be a complication. So today I'm only going to present three uh, cases where we went wrong. And uh, Dr. Arun is there, and he, he's an old friend of uh, Dr. Gurwaradis. And uh, so we, uh, we attended his talk just a couple of, I think last month this was, and he spoke about why do unis fail? And I'll be speaking about two of these complications which I faced in my practice. So first case is a 73 year old lady who presented to us with the left knee pain and medial aspect tenderness. And the x-rays were uh, very, looked very amenable for a uni and so did the findings intraoperatively. The surgery went very well. So the post-op x-ray, we were quite happy with it and she was doing quite well. After one month, she was very happy and a year later, she was very, very happy and she was quite keen to get the next side done as well. So the opposite side, the Oxford series x-rays look great as in amenable for the uni. And we went ahead with the case. Again, the three criteria that we check for every case, the ACL is intact, the worn out uh, medial aspect and the full cartilage in the lateral aspect. So we went ahead with the case and looked hunky-dory to me. And then two weeks later, disaster struck. Uh, so this is the first time I had seen this and we had read about it. Unfortunately, it happened when I was in the Bruges conference in Jan. So uh, we had to uh, hold off for a couple of days until we got back. And then we went ahead and we had to revise it. And uh, we took out the old uh, implants and we had to go ahead with a total knee revision and with the wedge as well on the medial side over here. Unfortunately, there was a little bit of wound uh, infection. Luckily, it was only a superficial infection. And finally, post four months post-revision, she's doing okay now. But obviously, she's not as happy as she was when she first came to us. So the question is, was it my fault? Uh, I would like to ask the uh, faculty if you felt that this x-ray could have been better initially, or do you think yeah, it's just a bit of bad luck? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, can you put the post uh, the fractured x-ray, please? Yeah. yeah. Right. I'll Keep the question open to faculty. We'll start with Emmanuel. Emmanuel, can you comment on this? What is the reason? And uh, in fact, I was there in the revision scenario in the theater. There was one suggestion you got to prop it up and then uh, fix it because the implant was not loose at all. So there was a suggestion that you can fix this part like a trauma and then fix in the medial tibial plateau. But we decided against that. Is that a reasonable option? I just want to know. We'll start from Emmanuel. Uh, I mean, the, the, the classic factors for, uh, for having this complication is that um, you would have not a maximum resection up to the ACL, so not a maximum surface. You would have uh, a low cut on the tibia, and you would have maybe uh, overcut the posterior cortex, and then the amount of pins you used. Um, if you did a recut, for example, and you had two initial pins and then you put two pins later, then you get lower down, you get a, a post stem effect. Um, now, as you see, it is always a sagittal fracture. Um, yes. And this is because when, when you resurface the proximal part, the hoop stress of the, of the proximal part of the cartilage disappears. And if you are, if you are un unlucky enough that the patient's HKA its mechanical angle drops just there where you had the pins, then you have a then you have a sagittal fracture. So it's a it's a combination of factors, um, and as you saw, uh, it's a it's a very low rate. So um, I don't think it should hold you back to continue to do them. The only thing what you could do is temporary after uh, when it happened is getting your patients a few days of crutches. I've seen that. Uh, if you make them walk quite early, as, as I did before, and um, they are sometimes limping so much, and if they have a varus truss gait, they put a lot of constraint exactly where you had your fracture. So using crutches for a few days can diminish that. Okay, Thank you. I'll let's go to the next one. Sure. Uh, Guru, so, uh, can, I, can I just add one point? Uh, the the preoperative, the immediate post-operative X-ray shows that the tibial component is in a slight degree of valgus, and there are there's an FEA analysis being done, uh, uh, a paper uh, which suggests that a slightly valgus cut increases the risk of fracture. Okay, 
Yeah. Okay, so and thank can you. I add something as well? I mean, no, if you look please, at the AP, the AP is no. fine. I'm afraid it's the lateral that's the problem. What's mm -hmm. happened is you've driven this saw out the back and created, uh, you know, a hell of a stress riser. So no, no. the real tip is to hold the front of the template right at the very front, uh, and mm -hmm. you have to hold it down with your hand. And when you're using the saw, you must be careful that the template doesn't go posteriorly. Yes. So I'm afraid the AP looks great. It's the lateral that's the problem. You've right driven it here. out the back. Now there's yep. next case. Yeah. Yep. So uh, as we know, the there's if we go too deep, you can have the stress riser. So that's probably what happened there. So I'll go on to my second case. This is a case from just a week ago. 46 year old lady present to us with left knee pain, and again the uh, Oxford series X-rays were amenable for uni, and so are the intraoperative findings. Uh, the case went well. We were quite happy, and this is one of the first few cases we had done, and this is the immediate post-op. I thought it was good then. And after two months, she was doing okay. I think the, I thought the view was not well, very well taken in this x-ray, but I thought she was doing fine. And then that's just a couple of weeks back. She came for one year post-op and lo and behold, we had the poly spin out, which I thought was just a theoretical problem until it happened to me. And uh, so this is what her, in the yeah, clinic. I think I have to ask this uh, a question to only Chris. Chris, you are the father of mobile weddings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right, the incidence is okay, have you got the uh, post-op picture? Yes, yeah. So the, the, the funny thing is we went in for the surgery. Uh, I just checked whether there's any ligament laxity uh, in both the planes and there wasn't. So I was pretty confident that we should be able to get away with the uh, bigger poly like Arun Sir had told in his talk. We went ahead and uh, what we found is the funny thing is the poly was automatically relocated when we opened on the next day. And even funnier was that it was relocated back to front. Um, if you can see, there's a big gap over there. So probably the poly was too small in the first place. We took it out and we found it was back to front. <laughs> and uh, then we went ahead with the case and I checked to see whether the ligaments are intact. And we tried, they were. And so we went with the trial polys. And... I could actually fit in two sizes higher than what I had put in initially. So it's definitely uh, too small a poly initially. So I'll just quickly run to my post. This is the post-op x-ray. And this is after um, the surgery the next day. So are we in the green zone or is there still something wrong is the question. Well, it looked like a, a small, is that right? Y yeah, it's a small. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the Japanese have done a lot of, um, you know, studies on the small patient and uh, you don't, you don't know, this looks like extra small, I think, it's black, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, sorry, this is an extra small. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I would try not to use extra small. small, we should probably remove it really too, because even in the very smallest of patient, you don't need to do that. And, and the entrapment for the extra small is slightly less than the small. I mean, you know, technically, it's pretty good. The, the femoral component's a bit far sort of into... Um, you know, I think, you know, you were just unlucky. These things happen and the likelihood is that it should be fine. It was probably just too thin a bearing. Why yep. is the lateral compartment so wide? It does look wide, doesn't it? It, it does, yeah. It, it's, that's what when we look at in retrospect, even the first text, it looked like that. So I, I'm not able to understand why. Arun, any reason for that? I'm just wondering whether the uh, uh, ACL, etc., was too lax. Uh, whether there was, it may look mechanically uh, intact, but it was probably not uh, functioning as it should, because it seems a huge gap laterally. Mm, you should probably insert your thumb in that gap. <laughs> probably it's a loose joint. Martin, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah. I can see that you are in the car now. <laughs> Uh, on the way to the airport. Yeah, a lot of mobility is happening. I'm sorry that we've held you, but I'm glad. The next case you will be discussing more. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Adesh, you are done with this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah okay. So the third so, case. Uh, yeah, the third case is the robotic case. An 84-year-old gentleman with medial aspect tenderness. The X-rays were amenable for uni. And so findings. And we did get a pretty good fix and a good balance. And this guy was very, very happy for two weeks. He sent us a video. It's just one week after the surgery. He 
He didn't even want to use his walker. He was very happy. And then after two weeks, his pain started. And this is after aggressive physiotherapy. So I was afraid that he had a fracture. The x-ray was perfectly fine. Even after a month, he was complaining of the same pain. And after three months, he's a little better, but he's walking much more tentatively than he was in the first week post-surgery. So the x-rays look fine. Yeah. So basically, there yeah, is so no the question is, what's the reason? What is the reason? He is fantastically pain-free for a month, and then the pain started slowly subsiding. Yeah, so I see this in my practice, and you know, the, the question I had for Chris about the tibial strain changes, we actually are doing a study with the guys in New York at HSS looking at this, and we're getting MRIs post-operatively. And in this case, it's actually a stress reaction in the proximal medial tibia in the metaphyseal area. And on the MRI, it lights up like a hand grenade. It went off on that. So we actually treat them as a stress fracture. So in this case, I think your components are well positioned. I think your alignment's good. Um, the tibia is nicely in a little varus, but I, I'm confident if you got an MRI, you'd see this proximal medial tibial metaphysis light up. And we treat them, like I said, I put them on crutches. Um, sometimes we'll put them in an, an unloader brace and put them on anti-inflammatories and just focus on pool. And they resolve in about four to six weeks. Okay. And the last question I'd like to ask is, do we have to refrain from going on to aggressive physiotherapy after unichondria, especially robotic? Sure, what is the yeah. question? The question is, do you think we should refrain from doing aggressive physiotherapy after a robotic uni or even a, a regular conventional uni? The, panel, yes. the pain started after the physio. Yeah, we have changed our physi physio completely after a partial knee. And we actually found that they move so well so quickly if you just leave them alone. So we send a therapist to their house to give them instruction. And then we will see them at two weeks and six weeks on their own with a booklet. And I found that has tremendously improved patient's uh, activity. In my hands, I'm more nervous about them doing too much because they're off a walker several days later. So I found backing down has changed my patient's activity um, and has been successful. So to answer your question, le let them get their motion without anyone forcing them. Okay, Arun. thank you. Arun. Yeah, okay. I should... Arun. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Arun was trying to say something. I think he was muted. Arun. Physio, role of physio. You're on mute, uh, sir. Arun? Avoid uh, yeah. physiotherapy for both unis and total knees. All oh, okay. right. Okay. You don't need it. Unless there's okay. some major uh, flexion contracture, um, severe quadricep weakness, I think most of these people really don't need physio. Oh, there's a good one. Yeah. Ashok? Yes, sir. Thank you. you go. Yeah, uh, good evening. Thanks for the ishq and Dr. Hemant and Guruva, sir, for giving this opportunity. And nice to be with the MN faculty and Dr. Arun Mulaji and Indian side. Thank you, sir. So this is not a routine practice of doing hyperextension for uni. So this gentleman came, sent us an X-ray to video consult of uh, AMOA. Oh, your eyes are not seen here. Yeah. So this gentleman. The no, six no, Arun, we can't see your uh, talk. We can't see your talk. We just see your Zoom. That's all. Your, your yeah, slides we can't are not see the... The slides. Yeah, we can yeah. see it now. Yeah. You can see it, sir? Yeah. 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 Go. So we don't do routinely for hyperextension in UKA. So this gentleman sent an x ray through a video um, email. Uh, it was an AMOA. So we just sent him a reply telling that you need a unique condyla. So what has happened is uh, a 60 year gentleman, AMOA. ADL is affected and his range of motion was 15 to 30 degrees, 130 in hyperextension and correctable valgus. And we are very skeptical in doing this hyperextension. It's not much published about it, but this gentleman is very particular about higher unicondylar. And we did an opposite knee for a comparison. It was not hyperextending. Even this knee had an endpoint. And he doesn't have any generalized ligament or joint laxity. And we did an MRI, the MRI showed ACL and PCL was intact and the medial uh, joint was arthritic. So we did a clinical examination under anesthesia. There was an hyperextension. We want to be make sure 
we are not other compartment is good if we had an oxford we now uh, done in any mri but since we had to do a fixed bearing in hyper extension we want to be double sure doing this procedure did an arthroscopy arthroscopy revealed it's an amoe on the medial side the meniscus was degenerated acl pcl was intact the lateral compartment and patellofemoral joint is good so we had a surgical option we explained him we may do a 50% chance of uk remaining all go tk so we discussed with our team colleagues my senior colleague dr suri and dr bose we had extensive discussion with them and the patient and we decided to go ahead with a uk so once we did arthrotomy we found this is the intraoperative picture it is a classical amoe with good acl and good pcl and was in other compartments very good so hence the plan of action we used robotic assisted the advantage we can do the virtual surgery and reduce slope and the tibial depth to be reduced and the increased thickness these were the goals before we started the this particular case so we proceeded with robotic assisted uka so we used navio assisted the standard morphing technology with navigation and it gives us a good planning and implant placement so we reduce the depth of resection and reduce the depth, uh, slope so that we can increase the poly so this is the graph it gave us there is a hyperextension it and it's lags across the range of tel 120 so we know it's 8 mm poly i wanted to make it 10 so the graph to be stable and this the image shows us contact point of the entire TK, uh, uk and bone preparation was being performed an intraoperative picture trial and we trial with uh, 8 to 10 mm poly and this is the flexion and this is a extension still you can see there is a 9 mm of extension 9 degree of extension in this after trialing so the pre op plan showed 8 mm poly still laxity of 4 mm hence we had added 2 mm poly so it in, uh, gap was balanced so we can see the final graph across the zone of 2 mm laxity opening up has been there with minimum hyper extension this is a clinical image after the final implantation and this is a final uh, post op x ray and hyper extension has been reduced to 3 the varus is 5 what we plan for 6 and we have kept him in a hinge knee brace for 6 6 months guarded and it's been one year he is doing good so the technology definitely makes difference in complex cases and the accuracy and precision every primary case also and thank you for this acho excellent uh, uh, presentation of a very unique case right let's open to the panel We'll start with Arun. Arun, Arun sir. Yes, sir. Any recurring items, or what is your your thought process on this? I think uh, both for total knees and you knees, if a patient is hyperextending, you've just got to make sure that there is no neurological component to this. Um, many of these patients have very weak quadriceps, and that's why they're actually hyperextending. So you need to be able to uh, be, uh, to convince yourself that there is no neurological problem. before you undertake this and if it's purely wear on the anterior surface of the uh, femur which is what we also see in hyperextending total knees uh, and we've uh, reported on those cases uh, that itself uh, is very good uh, for correcting it with a uni if everything else is good you just need to build up on the femoral side and i would really not uh, overstuff too much the uh, tibial side but rather distalize the femoral side where the bone loss has really occurred yeah martin thank you uh, martin role of uk in hyperextension and your technology is a wonderful way working here in this uh, illustrative case so what is your take on that yeah it's very interesting it you know when i first started unis i spent some time with uh, richard berger who warned me against the hyper extensive hyper lax and it's interesting that this case had a varus that was an overcompensating in the valgus because i find every millimeter of poly adds about on the medial side adds about a degree of valgus in the knee so it's an isolated recurvatum situation with good medial collateral ligament the ones i usually see are women who are super hyper lax and globally and those are the patients that i'm concerned that you'll leave in valgus either in flexion or extension. So, I think it's a subset of a patient into our hoon's discussion um neurologic muscle strengthening and bony deformity all have to be assessed, but congratulations on a successful approach. 
Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll ask this question to Christopher, but by the time, Samir Ali, can you, uh, Ashok, you, st you finish your, you stop the screen and let Samir Ali go, and then we will t uh, discuss with Christopher and then Emmanuel. Christopher, yes. again, Oxford's in hyperextension. Do you think uh, yeah, we, speak we, we hardly ever see it in the UK, um, so we have no experience. But in Thailand, it's relatively common. I mean, obviously not very common. And what they do there, they do what Aaron suggests. They exclude neurological issues. And um, what they do is they try and tighten up the knee a little bit. Um, so they would leave it, to, um, you know, maybe one or two degrees in extension. And as long as you don't overcorrect them into valgus, they seem to do well. But beware, don't start with these cases. They're quite difficult. Yeah, but what I'm saying is... Your mobile bearing has got a much more vulnerability to hyperextension knees. Am I right? No, no. It's a bit like the ACL deficient knee. I mean, you oh. know, ACL deficient knees don't fail because of bearing dislocation. They uh, hardly ever fail these days. They fail because of loosening of the tibia. So I think this whole issue about recovatum, about ACL, etc., is a bit clouded. They're so rare, so we have so little data on it. Just beware Imagine. them. Don't the youngster, the young surgeon shouldn't begin with these cases. They're difficult. Exactly. Emmanuel, can I have your opinion on this? UK in hyperextension. I have to admit that uh, on the patients I treat, uh, various knees, they usually have not enough extension. So um, I I can only see uh, hyperextension in our population in uh, neurologic problems, as Arun said and there would not be uh, indications for a uni. So I have no experience. I can only say that this was well done and that it's only doable with your robotic system because if you, if you would do a tibia first and then you would use a spacer technique, you would never obtain this result. So well done, but no experience, no. Okay. Let us move to Samir Ali. Uh, Samir Ali, your case, please. Yeah, yeah warm good evening. and. Uh... Let me thank the Ishk and Guru Varadisar and Vakanga for giving me this great platform to share with the eminence in the field of arthroplasty. So I'm presenting two cases. Actually, it is my journey through how I started the unique on the knee replacement. It's a 55-year-old female. She presented, she had a right knee pain, the BMI 32.5 with no other comorbidities, who underwent high TB osteotomy in 2013 from elsewhere. And later three years, this, this was our initial x-rays from the, they used an external fixator type of implants. And in 2016, she presented with me with bilateral knee pain, which most symptomatic on the left side. And this was her x-ray. But unfortunately, till that time, I didn't have done any unicondylar knee replacement. But at the same time, I have only two options, either to do an HTO or to do a partial or do a total knee replacement. But fortunately, just before two months down the line, I have completed the Oxford instructional course lectures. So I thought I will take a chance. So I went with the, the classical x-rays descriptions what the Oxford has given, give a valgus stress view, and followed the lateral, you can see the posterior con condyle is maintained and the parallel femoral joint. So that I did my first unicondylar replacement in 2016. This was actually the TBL cut I still take on at that moment. And 2018 down the line, I did a totally replacement on the other, other side and the patient is happy. So I asked her to send some videos and photos one week back. This is the x-ray she sent to me. You can see on the right side, this is a TKR scar. I usually do a navigator TKR and this is her, the pins of that. There's a flexion on the other side. This is a microplasty instruments the UK scar and this flexion is a little more, much better than definitely you take care. And the patient is still telling me that your, the first knee, what you have done is much, much better than my second knee. So this is this at that time, the 24 hour post-operative X-ray. Samir Ali, you're going to present any complication or you're just showing your results? My results, that's all, sir. Mm, so and another... you wanted the panel to discuss. Okay, fine. Yeah. The other... The other case we have to discuss, sir. Yeah, it's please. 70-year-old 70, 70 male is a doctor by profession, no other medical illness. He has a right side knee pain, significantly affecting his ADL. And this classical 70-degree virus, correctable 20-degree flexion. Andropocyte stability is good. And this was her x-ray at that time. So I thought uh, it's a complete bone on bone, middle compartment OA. So when with a, this is the lateral view, 
and for this, this was the exercise i went with a navigator total uh, portion replacement the initial barrel was around 5.5 degree and i took a 1 mm thickness with a 2 degree of slope only so still the final correction was 3.5 degree and that looks good to me initially but this is the initial post operative x ray but 10 months down the line the patient still continues to have pain so at that moment what about i have more worried about this osteolysis is it a sign of loosening or it can be ignored as a normal radiolysis will happens in a cemented knees that's what my question to be discussed yeah we'll start with uh, chris well i mean i can't if you could blow it up a little bit um, it looks like a physiological radiolysency in that there's um you can see a bit of cement under the lateral um bit um and yeah just there you can see radio loosening can you blow it up a little bit just to see zoom, zoom it up slightly samir ali yeah i will zoom it up yeah yeah go to the ap yeah that's it yeah, yeah. so there you can see around the uh, the lateral side it's looking like a, what we would term a physiological radio loosening if you look on the medial side it looks a little bit more um you know as though there's not much cement there I mean certainly um you know I wouldn't rush into revising this um but I as I say I'm not familiar with this implant I wouldn't do an isotope bone scan because they tend to be very very hot uh, for at least 2 years after surgery I mean I I think the femur's fine I I would be tempted to uh, even at this stage partially weight bear it and um if if you want a second opinion make sure it's sent to somebody who understands unis but I'd be interested to hear what Martin has to say Martin are you there yeah Yeah, I agree with Chris. I I think you know with two pegs in the femur rarely do I ever see the femur loosen, so I always think about the tibia. You know, once again, I would probably MRI scan this just to see if there is a change in the tibial metaphysis and occasionally I will scope these knees for articular tears. I have about 10 that have had lateral meniscal tears or patellar cartilage tears that were mechanical as well. So look at the whole knee, not just the pain, is there an effusion? um things like that but otherwise this looks well fixed so you won't touch that so samir ali you're still hanging on to that or you have done something i'm still hanging on to that hanging on to that take a trip. yeah i'm still hanging on to that. my doubt is uh, initially i've given a 2 degree of posterior slope so hmm. i st- uh, that is a reason why so i thought either there's more stress on that because when the patient going to more flexion there's can be a chance of post flexion tightness so whether is it the reason for this uh, that's i'm still holding on that so what about yeah, because uh, what are the i don't source opinion about this is it yeah, for you to yeah, yeah. can you do the pre operative lateral x ray by any chance pre operative lateral x ray what was the slope there yeah i will, I will reduce it yeah, so perhaps a little more than what you uh, reconstructed it yeah so you is only doubt i have because of i feel so because i thought around patient have around 5 to 7 degree of posterior slope so but in uh, intraoperatively i given only 2 degree so is it a really concern where, because when the patient more remove flexion is there a chance for rising the anterior part of the tbl base plate i think you yeah. you're going to have to look for uh, maybe doing a ct scan perhaps with uh, metal reti- um, uh, you know the artifact reduction Art- so okay. that uh, you can try and see whether there is any lucency beneath the tibial component because my concern is that the tibia may be loose there is a radio lucency which is almost in in the ap view which looks um, uh, almost a millimeter or so um so i would uh, of course rule out infection Uh, if this pain is persistent but more importantly i would rule out uh, loosening aseptic loosening yeah thanks samir ali i think uh, you stop the screen sharing we we'll go to jitinder meanwhile i'll ask emmanuel um <clears throat> this answer to the this question you will hang on to that or what is the role of slope what is this slope got to do with the outcomes you got any guidelines for us i think i think we have to reconsider slope in uni because we um we, we have to see it as balancing the flexion gap so basically uh um what you what i do in in the uni i use is i i do my 
my curtain, then I will try with my spacer if the flexion gap is okay. The flexion gap is okay. I don't really care about how many, how many, how many degrees I have constructed or not because it's a new, unique situation. You have to know that uh, on the medial side, part of the upslope that you see on the X-ray is because there is the medial meniscus. <clears throat> so the condyle rolls up and creates posterior condyle offset, which allows you to rotate around the knee and to have clearance on the lateral side. So I think we are too obsessive about measuring slope. You need to be sure that your flexion gap is right and then it's okay. And if you look at uh, technique, that is what uh, good fellow developed 40 years ago was get the flexion gap right and then bring it to extension. Okay, good. Now let us go to the last presenter. Jatinder, you are ready? Yeah, hello Jit sir, good evening. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Can I start? Yeah, I can start. Yeah, uh, first of all, good evening uh, to all the stalwarts of uh, partial knee replacement and my virtual teachers also. I started doing uni around seven, eight years ago and probably uh, five, six hundred by now I've done uh, with the uh, education from all of you guys and namaste. Uh, I'll start with the lateral uni. Uh, so this is one of the rare complex uh, indications. Uh, I did one case uh, that uh, lady was uh, of uh, age of 65 years, and I would post her actually left side. Uh, you can see only lateral compartment was involved. Uh, uh, the pain was also on focus on lateral side only. There was no pain on the medial side. Range of motion was good. There was no fixed flexion deformity. Uh, Actually, I wanted to present this case as a, what I did. The next one is complications. Uh, uh, should I tell the yeah. indications? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For ACL should be intact. Well, values should be less than 14 degree. There should be no FFT more than 10 degree. And there should be good range of motion. And this is the virus test. Lateral compartment is opening well. We should be able to correct the velgus. And uh, this is the lateral view. Yeah. And... Uh, I'll come to the. No, no, just show the post ops because we are holding the. Yeah, yeah, guy, yeah. This is this is important point. We need to look at the. Jatinder, your your yeah. Hello, Jatinder. Okay. The this is the to keep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. You are quite happy with the result. Am I are right? you able to hear me? Yeah. You are happy with the lateral uni. Am I right? Okay. Yes. Let, me, let me ask the other panelists. Chris, yes, what is your... The uh, the... Yeah. Jatinder, can you listen to me? Can you hear me? Jatinder, your internet is not right. Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So what role of uni or the results are as good as medial, lateral uni versus medial uni? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. the patients tend to be, if somewhat, uh, you know, they're even happier early on, certainly. Uh, you don't want to overcorrect them. Uh, the mobile bearing on the lateral side has a high dislocation rate as it stands at the moment. So uh, fixed bearing is the way to go on the lateral side for the seeable future. Arun, good. any experience with lateral unis? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Emmanuel, lateral unis? Yeah, I do many uh, because I think that uh, they are doing really well. And since I do it, as, as Chris said, with a fixed bearing, for me, it's a standard operation. Um, I believe they do better because um, the lateral flexion gap is open anyway. So there are no potential mistakes of uh, MCL isometry on the lateral side. Whatever you will do to the slope, if you get your components right, it will work well. And the only thing you have to think about as we see this picture is to be sure that you're lateral enough with your femoral component. Now, this said, I have to admit, actually, I saw pre-op is typically a case where I wouldn't do a uni because a patient with windswept has one side and lateral on the other one. I believe they have either rheumatoid arthritis or they have some other reason. 
disease progression. So um, I'm not courageous enough, but uh, happy to see uh, you guys are. Yeah, Martin, lateral uni with MACO. The results are and for outcomes are as good as medial. Yes, very good. And once again, usually they're women, easily correctable, as was said. Um, I would say a, a tip intraoperatively is it's easy to put the knee in a figure of four to clean out any cement and to really look to make sure the meniscus is gone and making sure you don't have a snapping popliteus and a lateral peripatellar arthrotomy works well, um, but they've done very well. Oh, good. Jatinder, you got one more complication? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure that. Uh, but I, I would like to add one important point on this particular case. Like we don't, we shouldn't remove uh, osteophytes from the femur. The implant actually rests on the lateral osteophytes from the femur, not exactly in the center of femur. It should be as lateral as possible. Good. A point so well taken. I, I'll go move to the, Yeah, go to the next yeah, yeah. one. Uh, this is, uh, uh, she was 52 year old female. She had good height. She was 5'10 and uh, she was little obese also. BMI uh, was around 34 or 35. Uh, there's major compartment disease, and this is the uh, post op x ray. Uh, th there was a you can say mistake on my behalf as surgeon, but uh, this is good case to learn for the beginners, I think. Okay, right. Let us invite the comments uh, starting from Arun. Arun, good, bad, or ugly? I'd rather not say. <laughs> But, Come on, man. <laughs> uh, but let me talk about the components. The femoral component is too far medial. It looks uh, uh, probably too narrow for this patient's bone size and it's far too medial. Uh, the tibial component looks like you uh, resected far too much of bone and uh, it's in varus and it's an extremely thick insert. I'm a little concerned about the integrity of the ACL because it looks like it's slightly subluxated. It could be because you over overstretched the medial compartment, perhaps you overstuffed it. And in the lateral view, the uh, tibial component seems oversized. So I think um, uh, the combination doesn't look very pretty. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you're totally right, sir. Uh, it was, I already stated that it is uh, wrong on my part female component is too medial and uh, ac this is uh, actually around uh, six months after the surgery by this time probably acl got torn initially during surgery it was intact or it was partially torn you can say Jitendra, it takes a lot of guts to show your failures and your technical uh, fallacies <laughs> Yeah, it, it is good for uh, learning for the yeah, new it, surgeon. It, 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 we are all here, just not uh, that every case is yeah. a success. Yeah, this, all this, this is uh, one after two years of the surgery. Yeah. Now it's totally gone ACL. And yeah. uh, this is two years after surgery. Now I have revised it. This is a peroperative picture. I did link, fixed bearing on this, let. And uh, this I've revised with the uh, now total knee with the intermediate non uncemented dot. I could use uh, the lateral tibia as graft. And, uh, yeah, wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. And now, last five minutes. Now, I will just ask the chat box any burning questions are there from Suhas. You stop. Yes, there's, uh, there's one interesting question because we, we talk so much about tibial pain. Any role of uh, oral alandronase or any other medication to decrease the tibial pain post op? Any medications? There, there is, yeah, there is some, there, there are some studies looking at that, adding a biphosphonate. I haven't seen any good results. There is another application where, with a lot of stress that's not resolving. There is a small study going on in New York where they're injecting a calcium um, called a subchondroplasty, which is used by the sports guys into the area to see if they can change the stress strain uh, inflammation. But I have no data to share. Jatinder, stop screen sharing, please. Okay. Go to the green. Jatinder, yeah, stop the screen sharing, please. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. There's, there's one more question. Probably Dr. Emmanuel Thiempon can think this because a lot of data comes from Europe. Is there any role of combining uni with an ACL reconstruction in a relatively younger patient? Emmanuel, you got the question? ACL uh, reconstruction. Uh, uni. The publication comes from Oxford. Huh? I think Chris will answer after me. Um, but it's clear that uh, 
it is well working now. There are not so many indications, um, but in a young patient, there is no discussion. We, our algorithm um, is that usually if you have a postural medial wear, you know that the ACL is gone. If you have a, a, a deep socket, it's too late. Um, and it's rather an indication for total knee. If you have a no deep uh, socket and you can still do a uni resection, uh, but they have laxity, um, I don't mean instability, but real laxity, which will be too important. I mean, by that, over four millimeters, you do ACL reconstruction, you do uh, your ACL, you do the uni, and you, you, you do the tibial fixation at the end. Uh, it needs some technical tips. Maybe maybe Chris can extend on that because he he has a nice presentation on that. So Nick, maybe uh, Chris, you answer the technical tips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first I just wanted to say that I mean this is very rare for those getting into unis. You know, you need to do about two hundred medials before you'll see one person who has cruciate insufficiency with medial uh, arthritis suitable for this type of procedure. But I mean, there, basically there are two techniques. You can either do the ACL first arthroscopically if you want, and then the medial uni, or I'm sufficiently old to be able to do the medial uni and the ACL um, open. Uh, technically, it's much more difficult than just a simple uni. The instrumentation tends not to work very well because it's post-remedial damage. So certainly don't start with these, but our, our results are pretty good. They do really well. And they're every bit as happy as those that have anteromedial osteoarthritis. Any comment from... Uh... Martin? No, I agree with what they said. I said, if you do them combined, your tibial angle usually has to change and you have to be careful of sequencing tensioning versus putting your final bearing in. But uh, I agree with Chris's outcomes. Yeah, so Hans? There's one more question. Would you contemplate uni in a failed HTO? In which case, what would your approach be? Yeah, good question. We will start from Arun. Arun, failed H2O, role of uni uh, i think uh, uh, you you can't just generalize talking about a failed hto because they can fail in different uh, methods they can be badly done htos they can be uh, htos where really there's no change in alignment and nothing really has been done so uh, i think you have to individualize based on uh, the x ray and the soft tissues as well uh, so I won't just generalize, but realize. yes, you can do it in selected cases. It may not be a great idea to do an, uh, a mobile bearing in these cases, but perhaps a fixed bearing would be a safer option. Chris? Yeah, I mean, if they've been overcorrected, you just have to do a long leg standing film. If they lie in valgus, if you do a uni, it's going to fail early on because of lateral progression. But as Arun says, uh, you know, a few of them, certainly the older ones, were left in vera. So if the uh, hip knee angle, uh, you know, goes through the medial side, you can use a mobile or a fix. It doesn't really matter. And the lateral side remains protected. So it depends on, on whether it's been successfully performed or not. Yeah, I'll ask Emmanuel, Emmanuel, just the same question. I'll put it in a different way. Uh, is Europe taking on high tibial osteotomies as an answer to young arthritic knee? Um, no, we, I, I think osteotomy in Europe is done until Kelgren and Lawrence grade three. Um, if it's grade four and bone to bone, it's a uni indication. I think we all agree. Um, I, I think you, you need to see bone on bone osteoarthritis before you go to arthroplasty. Um, and if you have it, it's too late to do, uh, to do osteotomy. I think the, the worst thing, especially in young patients, is to say to them that they are too young for a uni, and then you do osteotomy, which fails. Like one year later, they come back and they tell you, I'm still painful. And then you give them a total knee because you did an osteotomy and you're afraid. So um, I, would, I would clearly advise against that. So I think yeah. uh, talk to your yeah. patients, bone to bone. Don't be afraid to talk about uni. And, and I personally don't see it as a, as a temporary solution. Um, I, I don't have the same uh, follow up as as the Oxford group, but I'm doing now 20 years unis, and I mean I recently had to revise my first one for polywear, and it was a lady who after 10 years had an ACL tear, and she continued 10 years with an ACL tear and did postural medial wear. So I mean even in young patients you you can have success, and and I'm sure that Chris has a uh, has some data on on the mobile bearing at 
very long long term in young in young patients yeah i think we are coming to the last question and that has to be from me um there are two cohorts of patients as far as i can see in my practice the younger generation uh where it's classical amoa and the older guys so in these two cohorts uh which cohort has got a better outcomes i will start with chris uh, well the older it's far safer to start doing unis in these older people what has happened uh, historically is that surgeons use as i mentioned before they reserve unis for young patients with pre arthritis and manu has just said you know don't do them in people with early arthritis nothing works they don't need anything so actually because of the low morbidity i would start in the elderly patient if they've got antimuscular osteoarthritis as many of them have the low morbidity and mortality and the quick recovery is brilliant for them don't do it in these really young people start and do it in the elderly there's so many of them martin agree agree completely and and on top of that their expectations are much more realistic and unfortunately the younger patients especially the patellofemorals we haven't talked about they have a lot of residual pain for up to a year and their expectations are much more demanding and the term prearthritic was excellent because you really need to show subchondral wear and that they're bone on bone marun agree yeah i we showed you some of the data and all the scores suggest that irrespective of age uh, they seem to be doing well whether they're the young middle aged or the elderly uh, they seem to be doing equally well so i'm happy to do them uh, irrespective of the age merely the fact that they have anterior medial oe and they fulfill all the requirements that's great now guru what you didn't ask was the role of uh, proximal fibular osteotomy as a way of demolishing unis forever <laughs> we'll make it some other time <laughs> okay right thanks panelists and it's an excellent uh, uh, session and i personally thank and say sorry for holding you back 30 minutes i can see the mobility of martin rose i think getting into the hospital or airport <laughs> and uh, emmanuel coming back from the office in the car i can see chris and arun stationary <laughs> and giving us the time but i really value your time and very very thankful for your uh, insights and given us two and a half hours time thank you so much and i'm sure all the people enjoyed the thing and with your insights and the uni presence should be more and as you rightly said once i saw the unis because i fought for 5 years without coating unis but after sometimes we got convinced and especially after seeing arun's long term results last 3 years we had excellent results and now when i do the total knee i feel that i'm doing a great butcher job by destroying all these normal tissues so that is the one i think unis have to be there in the armamentarium of every knee surgeon and i'm sure all the youngsters should embark on this journey but the patient selection is very important i thank all the presenters the young up and coming guys jatinder samir ali adarsh and uh, ashok for giving you your time and i'm sure you all will be going higher and higher in your careers we wish you all the best thank you so much hemant thank you. ंग Hemant, all yours. Yeah, congratulations on a wonderful webinar. I think this uh, webinar series has generated a lot of interest, and I think surgeons are finding it useful. The next one is going to be on 10th of October, and it's going to be on avascular necrosis of the hip. Perhaps an enigma topic. I think, uh, and uh, we are getting faculty from uh, all over the world. Somebody from Korea to a couple of them from USA, and uh, you know, promises to be an interesting one. So look forward to meeting all of you again on 10th of October. Thank you very much, and good Thank night. Thank you, Sohar. All, All right. right. Take care, everyone. Yeah. My Bye. pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Arun sir. uh thank you sir i would like to thank all the faculties and the case presenters along with the host and our moderator and i would like to thank all the audience for joining in this number thank you sir stay safe good night take care thank you thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you
Grosa, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yes, sir. Yeah.